Post Tenebras Lux, After Darkness Light. Good to see everybody in the chat. Good to see you, DC, Kelvy, Jesus is Lord, Dwayne, Reasoned Answers, The Mazzo, Lars, Bible Care and Share Fellowship. Good to see you all here. I hope you'll be here by the time I'm done. This is going to be a tour de force. I may well have outdone myself. Uh, tongue in cheek, of course. But uh, I do have upwards of 200 slides. And I am not confident I'm going to get through all of them. I realize that some of the material I'm going to be talking about may require getting into some background discussion. So we're all just going to have to see how this plays out. Now, I, sometimes I get people who are uh, put out by the fact that I, uh, oops, sorry, just got a text, um, put out by the length of some of these live streams. But I know that a lot of you like it. And for those that don't like them being so long, all I can say is there's very easy solution to that. Simply press pause or click off and come back in and watch the rest of it later. Uh, there's there's no obligation to sit through hours and hours, but uh, I do plan on going quite quite a while tonight. So we'll see how far I get. <laughs> All right. Um, well, how shall we begin? I was. Uh, I'm competing with M to M. So actually, Slam, they wanted me on there tonight, but I had already planned on being here. So I think Jay Smith is over there talking about the satanic verses. But yeah, that's uh, it was too late notice. I had this up, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to change gears and do that. So anyway, uh, I'm glad you guys are here. Uh, and you can always do the same thing by just going over there and watching that later or watching me later, however uh, it strikes you as most fitting for you, um, for you all. All right, so I was uh, looking at YouTube the other day and I ran across a video from Tovia Singer. And I'm sure it didn't come up by accident. I tend to watch all sorts of things, all sorts of Jewish things, not necessarily anti-missionary stuff, but I do, I do get in my fair share of anti-missionary material. And so Tovia Singer is sometimes recommended to me. But uh, I mean, there's so many things I've seen from Tovia that I've wanted to respond to over the years. In fact, as I was preparing stuff for this one, something else occurred to me that I might want to do as a follow-up to this, but uh, here's the here's a two-minute clip from Tovia Singer that I ran across. Now, this isn't the whole thing. I'm trying to stay well within the fair use requirements of YouTube. However, so it was taken from a five-minute segment. You can find it on YouTube. I don't even remember the name of it. Uh, maybe I'll try and find it and put a link to it in the description box. But for the most part, what happened is Tobia speaking in some context. I don't know if it's in a synagogue, if it's in a church, if it's in some other venue, but a Christian woman apparently asked a question about Genesis 1 and John 1, suggesting that Genesis 1 sheds light on what we see in uh John 1 sheds light on what we see in Genesis 1. And then Tovia uh, had this to say. 
So I'm going to share the video here. John, we have a word in Greek, the logos. And that logos was a was a was with God, and that logos was a God, and that logos became flesh. Great. So now I say to you, I'll go with that. Let's now go back to the book of Genesis, chapter one, and let's see if we have any mention of a word. It isn't there. Do we have any mention in Genesis chapter one of a word? was with God? And the answer is, it doesn't exist. Do you have anything mentioned in Genesis chapter 1 that that word was God? It doesn't exist. Is there anything in Genesis chapter 1 that that word became flesh? It just isn't there. I, I probably have offended some people. What am I going to do? What you've done is you've illustrated, crystallized, that the book of John is an improvement on the book of Genesis that they are not, they don't comport with each other, not the same, but rather we have now an interpolation of a word which became flesh. But um, the point is that these ideas are not in Genesis chapter one. If they were, the only thing in Genesis chapter one is in the beginning, that's it. And then from there, John goes in a direction that's found nowhere in the Jewish Bible. And I, I say this to you, if it said that in the book of Genesis, that the word became flesh, and what we find in verse 17 and 18, if it was in Genesis, I'd be in church with you side by side. The reason why Jews are not in church is because there's nothing like what we find in John, and particularly the prologue, which is the most heightened and exalted expression of what's called Christology. We find nothing like that in the Jewish Bible. <laughs> Okay, there's a lot there. <sighs> Almost don't know where to begin. Well, let me begin with this, though. Uh, Tobia mentions at one point that he's probably going to offend people with what he's going to say. I don't get the impression from this clip of Tobia and most of what I've seen from Tobia that he's overly concerned about offending Christians. It, it almost seems to me like he gets a special pleasure out of that. Now, that may or may not be correct, but that's the impression I get. And one of the things that I think sort of contributes to the claim that that's an accurate analysis is the fact that I just can't believe, I just can't believe that Tovia Singer is really ignorant of some of the things that I'm going to bring up. Now, he may well not be familiar with everything I'm going to mention, but I find it hard to believe that he is just altogether ignorant of what I'm going to say. That There's really two options here, and I just don't see one of them being plausible. One option is he really is ignorant of the material I'm going to bring up. But in that case, why does he speak so authoritatively to these issues? Uh, and why is it that he's roundly regarded by people as a stalwart authority with respect to these things? Uh, but that being the case, namely that I don't think he's altogether ignorant of these things, seems to me like he's playing a colossal game of obfuscation. He's preying on the fact that most people aren't aware of all sorts of things that can be found in the Bible itself and in Jewish literature. But uh, notice a couple of things about what he said. Well, first of all, he didn't get John 1 right. I noticed a number of you were saying he sounds like a JW, sounds like a Muslim. And of course, he sounds like a Muslim because Muslims are often parroting JWs. When he cited John 1, he incorrectly cited it. John 1 does not say the word was a God. The, the relevant clause, kai theos ein halagos, means God was the word. And in English syntax, we say the word was God. There's no justification for rendering it as indefinite, meaning a God. That's just not uh, an accurate translation or rendering of the Greek. Now, if you listen to Tovia very much, you know that he often will criticize what he'll call uh, illicit translations on the part of Christians. Now, 
many non-Christian translations have been produced that end up saying the same thing, but he always sort of hides that. But he pretends it's because Christians either don't know Hebrew or because they're playing games with it. Well, here's Tovia doing the very thing he claims other people do. He's misinterpreting, mistranslating John 1.1 1, 1 in order to already make it sound scandalous to the Jewish ear, right? The idea that there's another God is not going to be palatable to any Jew, and it shouldn't be, right? It's not palatable to us either, and happily, it's not what John 1 says. John 1 does not teach that there is another God. It rather teaches that the Word is, in his very essence and being, one with the Father. All right, but uh, notice that the, the basic claim here is that Genesis 1 makes no reference to a word, and it certainly doesn't identify that word as something that was with God or that was God. And even more than that, Genesis 1 doesn't say that the word became flesh. Now, this last one, I don't even uh, understand how he even thought that was relevant to assert. I suspect it's because he thought he could slip that past people and get some mileage out of it. But no Christian asserts that Genesis 1 teaches the incarnation of the word. That doesn't make any sense from a Christian perspective any more than it does from a Jewish perspective. We believe that the word pre-existed his conception in verse, uh, birth. He pre-existed becoming flesh. And Genesis 1 necessarily antedates it comes before the incarnation. So the expectation that it would speak of the incarnation is uh, just a red herring. Uh, but notice that Tovia Singer said two things. We're going to get into the slides here in just a second. But he said that there's no notion of this in Genesis 1 or the rest of the Old Testament scriptures. Okay, So there's, there's two things here, really. Does the Tanakh itself teach us to think that God has an eternal, personal word? And is it legitimate to interpret Genesis 1 in such a way that the word is, that personal word is implicated in the events uh, that are there narrated? And you'll understand something of what I mean by implicated. Uh, we're going to get into a bunch of stuff here today. But uh, notice when uh, Tovia Singer said, <laughs> I'm going to share the slides now, but notice when uh, Tovia Singer said that though there's no word in Genesis, one of the things that he said was that uh, the only thing that John 1 has in common with Genesis 1-1 is the phrase, in the beginning. Okay, Now, that's no small matter to, to begin with. Okay, Whether Tovia Singer or anybody else thinks that John 1 is right in the sorts of things that it says, nobody can deny that what we have here is an intertextual reference to Genesis 1. Okay? Intertextual is just a fancy way of saying that these two texts are co-texts or texts that relate to one another and intend to be mutually informative. Or at least John himself intends what he's saying here to be understood in terms of Genesis 1. Okay? It's, it's not just, I mean, here, here's uh, the first five verses of John 1 and the first four verses of Genesis 1. Okay, it, it, it's certainly the case that there is this similarity here. But when Tovia acts like it's the only one, it's not. I'm going to show you a bunch of others. But this can't be just skirted as altogether insignificant. Okay, the, it, it's not just that the word beginning is used here. If you look in the Hebrew Bible, the, the phrase beginning, roshit, or in Genesis, Barashit, in the beginning, that word is only used twice in reference to creation. Okay, And moreover, in the book of Genesis, it's the very first thing that's stated. 
And so when we look at John's gospel and we see that John is talking about creation and he uses a phrase that's only used twice in the Bible in reference to creation, once in Genesis, once in another text I'm going to bring up in a moment, that is another intertext. You'll see what I mean. When, uh, when we realize that there's only two places in the Tanakh, the Old Testament, where that expression is used, and that in Genesis, it's the very first phrase, and that John does the same thing, there, there can be no question that John is evoking Genesis language here. No Jew would have picked up John 1 and read the phrase in the beginning without immediately thinking about Barashit, the book of Genesis. But notice, it's not true that it is only the word or phrase in the beginning that these two texts have in common. Okay, Both texts talk about God. That might seem just par for the course. Both texts talk about light. Both texts talk about darkness. You're starting to see a lot of red, aren't you? Both texts talk about something becoming. In fact, as you continue through Genesis, it continues to speak of things becoming as God speaks. And as I already said, both texts are all about creation. Okay, a lot of red marks there. <laughs> there can be no question that John has Genesis 1 in mind when he's writing John 1. Okay, so Toby a singer is clearly either out of touch, not as familiar with John 1 as he pretends, or he's he's just engaging in obfuscation here. The, there, there's just no way to avoid that these two texts are related, at least in the mind of John, that's the intention. Okay, But the real question that should be asked is, what John doing is, is what is is what John is doing here? Is it uh, something that is legitimate? Has John said something that is at variance with the Old Testament? Now, it, it wouldn't be sufficient to object merely on the grounds that John has told us something more, right? Surely, Rabbi Tobia Singer. Uh, isn't suggesting that we should dismiss John 1 if it were merely the case that John has told us more about what was true back in uh, Genesis 1. After all, the rest of the Tanakh says things about Genesis 1 that Genesis 1 doesn't tell us, but Tobia Singer wouldn't dismiss those further revelations. For example, I mean, you could read Jewish literature and you'll, you'll find all sorts of discussion about what's going on in Genesis 1, where they look to other texts, say in, in the Psalms or in the book of Job, uh, usually the wisdom literature, and they try and relate it to statements or expressions found in Genesis. And so, in other words, what they're doing is they're reading these things intertextually. If Genesis 1 makes reference to something, and you find something along those lines stated elsewhere, say, about angels, then usually, for example, uh, Jews will argue, when were the angels created? Well, the standard view is the angels were created on day two, and this is because of what's stated in uh, reference to the, the second day and certain statements that are made in connection with angels or the sons of God and so forth. I'm not going to go into that now, but the point is that Tobias Singer can't be ignorant of this. And if all he was saying is that John goes beyond what we could know from Genesis, then that wouldn't be an argument. But I maintain that it, it, uh, John is not going beyond what we can know from the Old Testament. And in fact, uh, in many ways, is simply giving us a standard Jewish understanding of Genesis 1. Now, by the way, uh, uh, just as a recommendation here, I may or may not read from this at some point, but this is a book written by a uh, Jewish scholar, Daniel Boyarin. He's the Herman P. and Sophia Taubman Professor of Talmudic Culture in the Department of Near Eastern Studies and Rhetoric at the University of California, Berkeley. He's written a number of journal entries in the Harvard Theological Review, 
He wrote a book called uh, The Jewish Gospels. And this book is one of my favorites. And it incorporates, I think, some of his Harvard uh, journal entries. But one of the articles in here, one of the chapters, is called The Intertextual Birth of the Logos, the Prologue to John as a Jewish Midrash. Okay, like I said, I may quote from this uh, in a bit, but what, in effect, Boyerin is arguing is that what John is doing here is just standard fare for what you see in Jewish exposition. And what he's doing is entirely in keeping, not only with Jewish practice, but with Jewish conclusions. Okay? Boyerin has been very forthright in arguing that ancient Jews, prior to the time of the Talmudic rabbis, and even contemporaneous with them, and to some extent, although beginning to dwindle, even para-rabbinic Jews down through the centuries, even to some extent into the medieval period. So ancient Jews predominantly held, some Jews still held at the time in the Talmudic period, and then sloping off even into the medieval period, that there were a plural that there are a plurality of persons in the Godhead. Now, uh, one of the things that Boyerin has done is, I think, advanced, that is, taken us further than some of the stuff that you might see in Alan Segal's book called Two Powers in Heaven. Uh, many people are familiar with Alan Segal's work by now, but Alan Segal points out that in the Talmud, there's all this discussion about what are called two powers texts. Now, the... Uh, the idea is that there are certain texts where it seems to be talking about more than one divine person. Okay, for example, in Genesis 19:24, after the Lord leaves Abraham and goes down into Sodom, the Lord is on earth, and we're told the Lord rained fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven. And uh, so there you have a subject-object distinction, one person doing something from the other, and both persons are called Jehovah or Yahweh. Yahweh reigned from Yahweh, right? The text even uses the direct object marker indicating a subject-object distinction. One person is doing something from another. When you look at the Targumic material, that's exactly how they understand it. Uh, now, there are many other texts like this. Uh, Exodus 24.1 says uh, that the Lord said to Moses, come up the mountain to Yahweh. That is, Yahweh speaking tells Moses to come up to someone called Yahweh, as though Yahweh were another, whereas it more naturally should have said, come up to me. Now, what makes this even more uh significant because somebody might just write this off as what's known as iliism, one person referring to himself in the third person, is that in the preceding context, God referred to the angel, the messenger, my messenger, the one that Isaiah refers to as the very messenger of his face, of his presence. God told Moses that he was going to go before them, that is my messenger, and they are not to rebel against him since my name is in him, right? And he won't forgive your rebellion. So this one has the prerogative to withhold forgiveness, and he bears in his very being the name of God. Okay? That's why it's not surprising when you read, say, in Zechariah 3, where we're told that the angel of the Lord is seated on a throne, and Joshua the high priest is there, uh, standing before him, and Satan is standing at his side to accuse him. And then the angel of the Lord speaks, saying, the Lord rebuke you, but then proceeds to declare Joshua forgiven, strips has him stripped of his uh, filthy garments and then clothed in clean garments. And then he says, see, I have taken your iniquity away from you. Okay. And by the way, the statement in Exodus 23, where it says, don't rebel against him. Uh, my name is in him. He won't forgive your rebellion. That expression is only used one other time in the Old Testament, namely in Joshua 24, where it's referred to God. Okay, So there you have an example of an intertextual 
reference, where the same phrase found elsewhere is picked up and used in another place, and it's it's a signal to that other place. You're supposed to see these two things as having some fundamental relationship to each other. All right. Well, in any case, uh, so Boyerin wrote a a great article uh, uh, talking about the intertextual birth. Oh, where I was going with some of that is the 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 shortcoming in Segal's work is when the Talmud is dealing with people that appeal to certain texts in the Old Testament to affirm the existence of more than one person in the Godhead, the Talmud refers to them as minim, or in the singular, min. And according to Alan Segal, this expression is a way of referring to Christians and or Gnostics. That is, some texts it refers to Christians, other texts it refers to Gnostics, in some texts it may have both in view. This is where Boyarin uh, has advanced the discussion, and he's he's done this in a number of ways. But one of the things that uh, Boyarin has pointed out is that it isn't adequate to look at the Talmud and say that this expression, min or minim, can be restricted to Christians and or Gnostics. And that's because some of the people in the Talmud who are upbraided for holding this view are famed rabbis. For example, at one point in the Talmud, Rabbi Akiva, who's perhaps the most famous rabbi of the ancient period, certainly uh, a, a most noteworthy rabbi in the Talmud, one of the earliest of rabbinic sages. Uh, rabbi Akiva, at one point in the Talmud, is, a, is accused of embracing, or of holding to, I should say, this position. Now, of course, you can't have one of your heroes uh, being the uh, purveyor, or one of the purveyors of this view. And so th the Talmud eventually clears the name of Akiva and, and tells us that he, he he repented of his error. But that shows you that this view was held by Jews and that it was powerful enough at, at, so as to appeal to somebody of the stature of Rabbi Akiva. Okay, That's just one example. Okay, So Boyerin draws attention to this sort of thing, and he's making the point that what's happening in the Talmud is not so much a reaction against Christianity and Gnosticism as it is a reaction to a belief that had currency among Jews before the advent of Christ, before the birth of Christianity, okay? before Christ came into the world, and before the apostles started proclaiming the gospel in the world, there was a belief among Jews that God is not one person, but a plurality of persons. This idea becomes dangerous once Christianity is on the scene, because now you can see it plays right into the hands of Christianity. And so what's happening during the Talmudic period, which is post-Christian, right, post-fall of Jerusalem, post-Bar Kokhba revolt, you're now looking at Judaism trying to uh, create its boundaries and mark it off itself off from Christianity. And one of the things that it does in the process is it is it begins to excise things like this that cater to Christianity. And uh, we're going to see more evidence of that in a moment. But uh, okay, back to the point here of the slides. Tobia Singer says Genesis one and John one have nothing in common besides the phrase in the beginning. Even if that were all the two had in common, it would already be huge. The expression, as I said, is only used twice. The phrase, the beginning, in reference to creation in the Tanakh. The full phrase, in the beginning, is only used once, namely in Genesis 1. And uh, it's used at the uh, very beginning of the book, just like it is in John. That's a telltale sign. It's, it's pointing you back to Genesis. But then you've got all these other uh, words that John is picking up that come right out of Genesis. By the way, I mean, there's even this uh, 
uh, pronounced contrast. Uh, even the grammar here is is just you know <clears throat> perfectly in sync with each other. Uh, for example, when uh, when John says in John one one, in the beginning was the word, he uses in Greek the imperfect tense. Okay, the imperfect tense indicates that the word already was. Okay, the the word was there in the beginning, but not as something that came into being. He already was there. Okay, that's the idea. But there, this is not just indicating the eternality of the word, that he precedes the coming into being of everything, but there's a pointed contrast between the word that was, that precedes everything, and everything else which becomes. Okay, so you have the word was, but everything else became. Verse 3, all things became through him became through who the word right well if you look at genesis 1 3 and several other places in genesis 1 and you look at the greek text right it's the same in in the hebrew text but in the greek text it's the same terminology uh, in fact i'll show you the greek here in a moment but uh in, in genesis 1 3 it says god said let there be light and we're, we're used to seeing the phrase there was light in english but literally, it says light became. Okay, so there's a pointed contrast between God's word, his utterance, and light coming into being. Okay, that's the same contrast that's in view in John 1. Okay, but here's the Greek. Uh, you have the same word, arche, or archi, uh, referring to beginning, or enarche, referring to in the beginning. You have various forms of the word for God, uh, used in the, there's, there's different forms of the word depending on how it functions in the sentence. It's the same word. Sometimes it's articular. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's what's known as a genitive. Uh, sometimes it's a accusative or a nominative. Um, but it's the same word. It's the word for God. You also have the word for light, phos. You have the word for darkness. Uh, you have the word for coming into being. Uh, and there's different forms there. I realize that as you're looking at that, you're thinking <laughs> some of these words look differently. You're saying they're the same. But remember that Greek in particular is a inflected language, which means that words change form depending on how they're functioning in the sentence. Uh, so and some words can change quite drastically. And you just kind of have to know the rules of how things change in order to recognize what words in view here. So. Uh, you know, egeneta, geneta, theto, uh, all come from genomai. Okay, so you have, uh, if for those of you that can at least sound out the Greek characters, that's why those expressions there look different but are actually the same. All right, so another thing that Tovia said was you have no reference, uh, in the entire Old Testament, uh, to a the word. Uh, with respect to creation. Now, there he's playing a bit of a game, right? He's he's playing on the fact that, technically speaking, Genesis 1 doesn't use the phrase word, right? And and that's true. It it's repeatedly says God said. However, elsewhere in the Bible, it shows us that this is a quite natural conclusion. If it says that God spoke and the world came into existence, then it means that these things came into being by his word. Right. Psalm 33, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made and by the spirit of his mouth, their host. Who would deny that Genesis or Psalm 33 is relevant to the interpretation of Genesis one? Obviously, it's talking about creation. But here it says it, everything was created by his word. OK, we also have uh, other things said about God's word. Psalm 105 speaks of God's word uh, testing him. Uh, Psalm 107 speaks of God sending his word and healing uh, them. Uh, Psalm 119 says, your word is settled in heaven. In Psalm 147, uh, note some of the, what at the very least have to be understood as personifications, at the very least, right? Uh, in Psalm 147, it says that his word runs very swiftly, right? So at the very least, this poetic expression has to uh, mount up at least to the level of being a personification. That is where something otherwise thought of as abstract 
or impersonal is spoken of in personal ways. Now, I'm going to argue that God's word, at least in various places in the Old Testament, is used not merely as a personification, but as a full-blown person. But here, at least, we can say this much. There are terms and expressions used for God's word that, at the very least, are personifications. In Isaiah 55, it speaks of God's word going forth from his mouth, and it will not return to him empty. It will succeed in the the matter for which he sent it. So God's word is sent, it goes forth, and it returns to him. His word runs swiftly, right? Well, notice this curious expression in Genesis 3. This is the, I just like the way the uh, American Standard Version, this is uh, the American Standard Version of 1901 renders this. Um, And actually, I might have, I might have written it in there wrong. It's mostly accurate. I think the American Standard Version uses Jehovah there. But anyways, uh, the verse says, They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Okay. Now, the Hebrew expression is kol Yahweh Elohim. Okay. The subject of the sentence, okay, the one doing the action of the verb, is the voice, the kol Yahweh Elohim. What they heard is the voice, the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden. Okay, The Targum, one of the Targums, Targum pseudo Jonathan, renders it this way. They heard the voice of the word, or memra in Aramaic, of the Lord God strolling in the garden at the decline of the day. Now, here I should explain for those that don't know what a Targum is. After the Jews were exiled uh, in into Babylon, they came to speak Aramaic, and uh, eventually, a lot of their reflection, their commentaries, other things uh, are put down in Aramaic. And uh, even after the Jews return to Israel, there's still a lot of stuff that is taking place in Aramaic. So, for example, if you were to go to a synagogue in the first century, even in Israel, one of the things that would happen is uh, a person would stand up to read uh, some select portion of scripture. He would read the Hebrew text, the inspired text, and then he would interpret it in Aramaic. That Aramaic interpretation would sometimes include expansion, um, exposition, Sometimes they would make statements to clarify the understood meaning of certain words, right? So sometimes you get a a very straightforward translations. Other times you get more expansive translations. Some people will say paraphrases, but it's actually more technical than that. Usually these expansions are based on intertextual readings. Okay, usually these expansions are based on the recognition that this part of Scripture is in some way related to this part of Scripture, such that this part sheds light on this part, and then therefore can be used to enhance our understanding of it. And so often when they would paraphrase the Old Testament, they would incorporate stuff from elsewhere in Scripture. Now, I'm not suggesting that this is inspired, but to the extent that it's accurate, that these texts really are co-texts, and and I'm going to show you a a profound example of this in a bit, Uh, but uh, to the extent that they are rightly relating certain texts, uh, then the, the resulting meaning is accurate, even if it's not a strict translation in every case. But here's Targum Pseudo Jonathan. Targum Pseudo Jonathan from somewhere gets this idea that Tovia Singer says can't be found in the Old Testament. Okay, well, at least this much we can say Targum Pseudo Jonathan thought it was accurate to understand Genesis 3 8 as a reference to the activity of something called the Memra. Okay, in that's Aramaic, the Hebrew expression is Dabar. And the Greek expression is logos. 
Okay, so if we were to render this into Greek, it would say they heard the voice of the Logos of the Lord God strolling in the garden at the decline of the day. Now, Logos, of course, is the word that John used in John 1.1 and John 1.14. It's the same word that John uses in 1 John 1.1, the same word that John uses in Revelation 19 as a reference to Jesus. Okay. Now, uh, another book, and I'm probably not going to quote from it, uh, another book I'd recommend to people is a book written by John Ronning called The Johannine Logos, where he demonstrates conclusively that John was familiar with the Targums. Okay, I'll give you one example uh, that shows this. Um, you're all familiar, for example, with uh, Revelation 1. When Revelation 1-4 speaks about God, it refers to him as, uh, him who is and who was and who is to come. Now, if you look in the Old Testament, you, you won't see that anywhere. However, if you look at the Targums, you'll see that that was one of the ways they paraphrased or gave an expansionistic understanding of God's self-declaration to Moses in Exodus 3.14. When God said to Moses, when Moses asked, what is your name that I may say uh, to the children of Israel, who it is that sent me to you. God said, Echyach Asher Echyach. I am who I am. Thus shall you say to the children of Israel, Echyach has sent me unto you. I am has sent me unto you. The Jews understood that to include, among other things, the idea of God's eternality, his self existence, okay, that he is, he was, he is to come. He's the eternal one, okay. John is using an expression that wouldn't have been foreign to Jewish ears. Okay? It's not found in the text of, Gen uh, of Exodus, but it is found in the Jewish exposition of the name found in Exodus. Right? The, the way this was expressed in Greek is somewhat similar. I mean, it's, it's not going to sound the same, but the import is traveling along the same track. If you look at the, the Greek version, uh, it says, ego emi ha on, right? I am the being, right? The existing one. It's identifying God as the one who has being or life in himself, right? He, he is in and of himself the existing one. Uh, it's another way of bringing out the same kind of thing that is expressed when you say he is the one who is and who was and who is to come, right? From eternity to eternity, he is God. Um, all right, so John was familiar with the Targums. John uses this expression for Jesus. You have in Genesis 3, 8, in the Hebrew text, already this curious expression, the kol Yahweh Elohim, how does a voice walk? The Targums uh, choose to identify this as the word. It's the voice of the word of the Lord God strolling in the garden. Where do they get this notion of God having a word? such that it can walk, even stroll in the garden at the decline of the day. Okay, here, Here's another example. This is two verses later, Genesis 3.10. It says, he said, this is Adam speaking, I heard the, thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. Targum Pseudo Jonathan says, he said, I heard the voice of your word in the garden, and I was afraid, for I was naked because I neglected the commandment you gave me. Here's Genesis 15, 1 and 15, 6. <clears throat> uh, after these things, the word of the Lord. So this is the Hebrew text. The word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying. Now, follow this closely because people just read past this, but it's critical. It's the sort of thing that Jews paying close attention to the text picked up on and it accounts for why they were comfortable referring to other places where God appears and speaks as appearances of the word. Okay, The Hebrew text itself says that the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying. Okay, it's, it's not, the text here is not saying that what was said to Abram is the word of the Lord. It's the word of the Lord that came to Abram in a vision saying. The word is portrayed here as the speaker. It's the word who came. It's the word who spoke. 
saying, do not fear, Abram, I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Then he believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then in the Targum of Ankalos, which, by the way, is the official Targum of Babylonian Jewry. Okay, this is the, uh, the one that they accepted as their official Targum. It says, after these things, the word, Pithkama, so it's a different word here that they use in Aramaic for word. The word uh, of the Lord came to Abram in prophecy saying, fear not, Abram, my word, my memra, shall be thy strength and thy exceeding great reward. And he believed in the word, memra, of the Lord, and he reckoned it to him unto justification. Right, justification and reckoning it, reckoning it to him as righteousness are the same thing. Right, so here's Targum Onkelos saying that it's God's word who would be the strength of Abram and that Abram believed in the word. Now, as you're listening to this, in some places you might wonder, does it intend here for us to understand it as an actual person or is this just a way of referring to spoken words. Now, I've already said that the Hebrew text here points to the word as speaker. And Targum Onkelos here is naturally understood, I think, at this point, and I'll show you places where it's even clearer, at this point of understanding that what was spoken to Abraham or Abram is the promise that his that God's word would be his strength, his word, his personal word, and that Abraham believed in the word, that is, the person known as the word. Okay, but we'll, we'll come to more uh, clear expressions in a moment. But I just put that bug in your head because that's commonly how a lot of people will read some of this and how they try to uh, finagle their, their way out of it. Here's Genesis 127. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Targum, uh, the Jerusalem Targum says this, the word of the Lord created man in his likeness. Note the pronoun, the word of the Lord created man in his likeness. In the likeness of the presence of the Lord, he created him. The male and his yoke fellow, he created them. Note now that the word is referred to here by a personal pronoun, his, the action of creating man is ascribed to him. Moreover, this one who is portrayed as a person and who does the divine act of creating is distinguished from the Lord. It says that he created man in his likeness. In the likeness of the presence of the Lord, he created him. So the Lord now is referred to in the third person. So now, who is this word? <laughs> Right now, we, the word is spoken of in personal terms. The word does divine actions, and yet the word is distinguished from someone called the Lord. Now, by the way, if you think this is already huge, if you haven't heard any of this, it's about to get a whole lot better. We're not even close to what I really am trying to get to. This I just consider to be sort of necessary uh, startup. All right. I mentioned before that a lot of people try to dismiss some of this as mere personification or a way of avoiding speaking of God anthropomorphically. Okay, so this concept of the memra, this is later scholarship. It became all the rage uh, in the, you know in the 19th century or the 20th century, the 1900s, for people to say that this is just a way of avoiding anthropomorphism. That is a way of avoiding talking about God in ways that sound too earthly, right? Too human-like, right? Now, Christians have always understood uh, that God is able to condescend and appear and converse with his creatures without that entailing of necessity, a real limitation of his being, right? God told Solomon and the people of Israel, that he was going to dwell in the temple that they were to construct. After the temple was built, Solomon, in his prayer in 1 Kings 8, marvels over that promise, and he says, Shall you indeed dwell on earth? 
heaven, even the highest heavens cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. So Solomon recognizes that although God is going to dwell in the temple, this by no means circumscribes God. God is by no means confined to the temple like some pagan idol, right? God doesn't need temples built by human hands. He's not May, uh, protected by them, he's not contained by them, he's not restrained by them, he's not tied to them, and so forth. Okay, that's just plain old biblical teaching. There's no necessity to introduce some kind of quasi expression to avoid uh, talking about God in this way it's as if God appearing entails a limitation of his being. It's not because God is limited that he's able to appear. It's because he's unlimited that he's able to manifest himself in palpable ways to his people. That's not a limitation. It's uh, something that he is ipso facto able to do by virtue of his greatness. Okay, but So some people will say this, this is a mere way of avoiding anthropomorphism, a way of uh, compromising divine transcendence, uh, and sometimes they'll refer to it as a personification. This is a quote from Daniel Boyerin. Okay, this comes from an article in the Harvard Theological Review. He says, among Jewish scholars, as Hayward has put it, since the time of Maimonides, it had been the custom to understand memra, along with certain other targumic terms like shekinta, should say shekhina, and yachara, glory, as a means of avoiding anthropomorphisms in speaking of God and thus defending a notion of his incorporeality. Nachmanides, however, disagreed with Nachmanides on this issue, although he held that the words had a secret and mystical meaning which would be revealed only to those versed in the Kabbalah. Okay, now before I go on, let me just point out here, Nachmanides and Nachmanides, Rambam and Ramban, respectively, right? Rambam is a way of uh, referring to Rabbi Moses ben Mahmanides, R-M-B-M, -M, Rambam, right? And Rambam, Ramban, is a way of referring to Rabbi Moses ben Nachmanides, right? So these were two famous medieval rabbis, two of the foremost, and they both uh, had a different view uh, with respect to things like Memra, Shekhina, and Yachara. Now, here, Nachmanides is decidedly more in touch with ancient Judaism. Okay? Nachmanides represents, in many ways, a rationalistic departure from what was found in earlier Judaism, even more of a departure than what you'll find in the Talmud and other things. But in any case, that's the, I don't want to get too distracted by that. Here's the point. Uh, Nonetheless, Boyerin goes on, the idea that Memra was simply a means of speaking about God in a reverent manner befitting his omnipotence and otherness was not unknown from the time of the Middle Ages onward. Okay, so he's still quoting there. The consensus of scholarship since the 1920s has been like Maimonides' view. Here is Raymond Brown. He's a liberal Roman Catholic scholar. Um, here is Raymond Brown representing the standard view. Targum Onkelos speaks of the Memra of Yahweh. This is not a personification, but the use of Memra serves as a buffer for divine transcendence. Now, I, I should make a, a couple of observations here. First, I just remind you that Boyerin is quoting Raymond Brown not in favor of what he says. He's about to refute him, okay? But this is the standard view since the 1920s. Scholars have been traveling along these tracks, reducing the memra merely to a linguistic device to avoid speaking about God in anthropomorphic ways, right? So he's saying that when the Targum speaks of the memra, it's not a personification. And by the way, this some of this can be confusing because usually when the word personification is used, it's a way of saying that it's not really a person that's in view, but a, a thing that's being spoken of as if it were a person. But the way Raymond Brown is using it is that it really is a person, right? So he's saying, when he says this is not a personification, he's saying, Memra does not really refer to a person. 
Rather, it, this is, serves as a buffer for divine transcendence. This is a way, whenever Scripture speaks about God appearing or God speaking to man or God doing anything that involves any kind of condescension that would entail limitation, the Targums, Brown is saying, uses the term memra in order to avoid speaking about God in these limited ways. Okay. Now, I've already explained that's altogether unnecessary in light of Old Testament theology. Old Testament theology teaches that God can be transcendent, retain his transcendence, while nevertheless manifesting himself on earth. Right? His transcendence is not a limitation on his ability to act in the world. It's precisely because he is the transcendent creator of heaven and earth for whom there are no uh, larger realities that can restrain him. He is able to do whatever he pleases, including manifest his presence in the temple, appear in a pillar of fire, uh, atop a mountain all ablaze. God is able to do this precisely because of his transcendent greatness, not in spite of it. Okay, but listen to how Boyerin goes on. It seems not to have occurred to any who hold this view that it is fundamentally incoherent and self-contradictory. Surely this position collapses logically upon itself. For if the memra is just a name that simply enables avoiding asserting that God himself has created, appeared, supported, saved, and thus preserves his absolute transcendence, then who, after all, did the actual creating, appearing, supporting, saving? Okay, what he's getting at is, remember, those who say that memra is just a way of speaking in order to avoid divine transcendence, uh, it's, it's a way of attributing this to the memra and not to God directly. He's saying, well, the memra is the one who creates, appears, supports, saves, preserves. And so if the memra is not God, then who, after all, uh, how does this preserve God's, uh, well, let me just read it from the beginning. Surely this position collapses logically upon itself. If the memra is just a name that simply enables avoiding asserting that God himself has created, appeared, supported, saved, and thus preserved his absolute transcendence, then who, after all, did the actual creating, appearing, supporting, saving? Either God himself, in which case one has hardly protected him from contact with the material world, or there is some other divine entity, in which case the memra is not just a name. Indeed, as pointed out by Burton Mack, the very purpose for which Sophia, that's the Greek word for wisdom, or logos, the word for word, developed within Judaism was precisely to enable a theology of the transcendence of God. The currently accepted and dominant view ascribes to the use of the memra only the counterfeit coinage of a linguistic simulation of a theology of the transcendence of God without the theology itself. Rather than assuming that the usage is meaningless, it seems superior on general hermeneutic grounds to assume that it means something. It follows then that the strongest use of memra is that it is not a mere name, but an actual divine entity or mediator. Okay. To whittle this down, what Boyerin is saying is if memra is simply introduced in order to avoid compromising God's transcendence, then it, it, it creates the problem of either. Uh, I mean, it leaves us with the question, who did, who did the actual work then that the memra is being ascribed to the memra? If it's God, well, then you have the language being used, but the theology of God doing these things that the language is supposed to get rid of. I mean, it's just, it's logically, in con it's logically contradictory is what Boyarin is, is, is driving at here. But let me show you, before getting into some really, really good stuff, not that this isn't good, but let me show you some examples in the Targums where it's very clear that the Memra is not just a mere personification, but a reference to a divine person. Okay, Here's Targum Neophyte, Genesis 28. 
Jacob vowed a vow saying, if the word of the Lord will be my support, and will keep me in the way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, so that I come again to my Father's house in peace. Then shall the word of the Lord be my God. Okay, The Targum, Targum Neophyte, Genesis 28, refers to the word of the Lord as the God of Jacob. Okay, Number one, this does not avoid associating this activity with God. If this language is used to introduce a term that avoids speaking of God in anthropomorphic ways, then it doesn't do it because here the word is identified as God. Okay? And this also rules out that the word is merely a, uh, an abstract thing. The, uh, Jacob says, then shall the word of the Lord be my God. God is not an abstraction. Okay, here's Exodus 3. This is from the fragmentary Targum. It says, the memra of the Lord said to Moshe, he who spake to the world be, and it was, or it became, and who will speak to it be, and it will be. And he said, thus shalt thou speak to the sons of Israel, Echyech, which means I am, hath sent me unto you. Okay, so it's the memra of the Lord who said to Moses, the memra of the Lord who spoke the world into existence, the memra of the Lord who said, I am to Moses. Here's Targum Pseudo Jonathan on Leviticus 26. I will set the Shekhinah of my glory among you, and my word shall not abhor you. But the glory of my Shekhinah shall dwell among you, and my word shall be to you for a redeeming God and you shall be unto my name for a holy people. Notice that God is speaking here. He speaks about his Shekinah and about his word and says that his word shall be for them, the people of Israel, a redeeming God. So here the word is distinguished by God himself from his Shekinah and from his own person, but identified as God. Targum Neophyte on Deuteronomy 26 says, This day you have made the memra, the word of the Lord your God, to be king over you so that he may be for you a savior God, promising to walk in the ways that are right before him. Here again, the memra is spoken of as a person. He's called king. It's said that they have made him to be king over them, meaning they've accepted his kingship, his rule, and he is for them now, as a consequence of that, their savior, a savior God, and they're to walk in his ways. Here's Targum Pseudo Jonathan on Deuteronomy 4. It says, the custom of other nations is to carry their gods upon their shoulders, that they may seem to be nigh them, but they cannot hear with their ears, be they nigh or be they far off. But the word of the Lord sitteth upon his throne, high and lifted up, and heareth our prayer, what time we pray before him, and make our petitions. Uh, by the way, there's an intertextual reference here that the Targum's picking up on. That phrase, sitteth upon his throne, and then it, when it says high and lifted up, that language is only found in the prophet Isaiah. It's the language that Isaiah uses in Isaiah 6 when he speaks of the Lord being high and lifted up, right? And the train of his robe filling the temple, okay? If you look at the Targum on Isaiah, I don't have it here, but if the, the Targum on Isaiah, the Chaldee paraphrase, is, you could look it up online. It's, it's available on uh, online for free. In the Chaldee paraphrase, the Targum, it says, that the one that Isaiah saw who was high and lifted up was the word, the memra, right? The uh, One other time when Isaiah uses that expression high and lifted up is in Isaiah 52, when the Lord speaking of the suffering servant says, behold, my servant shall be high and lifted up, right? That expression is used in Isaiah 6 for the word, according to the Targum, for the Messiah in Isaiah 52, and here it's used for the word in Deuteronomy 4. But in any case, it should be painfully clear 
that the word, though distinguished from a divine person, who, who uh, the, the Lord, is himself nevertheless portrayed as Lord. He's said to be seated upon the throne. He's the object of Israel's prayers. He's the creator of the world, the creator of man. He's the savior of man, the redeemer of man. Right? How much more obvious does it get that the Targums are using this as an expression for a distinct divine member of the Godhead. Okay, that's why Daniel Boyarin is being very honest and, and uh, uh, very scrupulous with these texts when he says that it's clear that the, the Memra is a person according to the Targums. Okay. Uh, I could keep going with some of these. All right. I'm going to stop there just for a moment, just for a moment to catch my breath. There's a lot more to go, folks. There's a lot more to go. <laughs> that was the warm up. That was the warm up. And by the way, I, I do know that when I first came on, I somebody sent me a super chat for a coffee. I saw that. Oh, and I see there's some other super chats. Let me get to these real quick. Thank you so much, Dwayne. Thank you for that. So next time you see me on the show with a coffee, you can consider it part of your, your contribution. Thank you so much. Um, and there's another super chat down here. Like I said, don't tune out, folks. And if you tune out, make sure to come back because uh, I'm just getting started. I'm just, I just got comfortable in the seat. Uh, so Binet says, glad you speak slowly enough so I could catch up quickly after joining late. Have some more of the four bucks, Swill. You like. Thank you, uh, Binet. Um, I really want to stop getting uh, coffee there, making my own. I just got used to it. I told you all the story before. I was in seminary, couldn't make coffee at home. My daughter has all kinds of allergies and reacted to it. So anyways, uh, thank you so much, Binet. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ozzy. Oh, everybody recognizing my, my love for coffee. <laughs> so Ozzy says, any advice on how to witness to Mormons? I invited them to come over to discuss the gospel. What points would you recommend? So I actually used to engage Mormons a lot because I lived in Las Vegas for 20 years. Las Vegas, of course, is in Nevada, which is right next door to Utah. And Mormons were involved in a lot of the original building up of Las Vegas. They came over for work, worked on the Hoover Dam, all those sorts of things. And so that uh, resulted in there being a, a sizable number of Mormons in that area. So I used to talk to Mormons all the time. One of my approaches now, uh, there are some people that will go into every nook and cranny of Mormonism. Uh, I, I just got used to doing at least, you know, I could, I was happy to talk with them about other issues, but if I had the opportunity to kind of begin the discussion or maybe direct the discussion, then I had a, a particular approach that I used to take. Mormons, of course, believe that you are saved by your own efforts, and grace plays a, a little role in there, too. And they're, they're kind of like uh, Catholics in, in certain respects. But there's a statement in the Book of Mormon where it says, we're saved by grace after all that we can do. And so one of the things that I say to Mormons, <laughs> I usually start off with that statement, and I say, can I ask you a question? And you know, they'll say, yes, they're nice fellows. And then I'll say, have you done all that you can do? And usually nine times out of 10, nine times out of 10, usually 10 out of 10. I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever gotten a Mormon that said otherwise. They'll always come back with this statement. I try, I try. And then I'll say, well, then what hope, what hope do you have? And they'll say, what do you mean? I said, well, the text says your text, you're saved by grace after all that you can do. So grace doesn't even come into the equation 
until you've done all that you can do. Have you done all that you can do? And again, they'll come back and you, you gotta, you know, you gotta keep pushing this on them. Uh, I don't mean in some kind of belligerent fashion. I just mean, keep, keep bearing down on them, showing them the, the, what their system leaves them with. The text says you're saved by grace after all that you can do. It doesn't say after you try to do what you can, after all that you can do. Have you done all that you can do? Okay, so think about it. If you're a Mormon and you're going door to door, did you quit yesterday when you could have gone one more door, right? Did you pedal down the street and cross the paths of one additional older person that you could have helped across the street, right? Maybe you helped the five before that, but not this one. Have you done all that you can do? And now here's where I, I'm usually, that's just the, the way I try and start things off. At this point, I then say, let's let's talk about the Ten Commandments, because I, I really what I'm trying to do here is to get into some of their bogus theology, but also keep it related to the, the issue of the gospel and salvation. So I say, okay, so if, if we have to do all that we can in order to benefit from God's grace, what's the standard that tells us what it is that we're supposed to do? Now, one of the things that I used to love doing was going to uh, Temple Square in Salt Lake City, and I would stand right in the middle of Temple Square where they had a replica of the Ten Commandments. Okay, So I had the Ten Commandments there as an object lesson. And I would say, have you kept the first commandment? Now, a Mormon will say, of course, you know, that, you know, we, uh, first commandment says, have no other gods before me. And so then I'll say, how many gods do you believe in? And they'll usually say, they'll try and weasel out of it. They'll say something like, we only have one God. And I'll say, so do you believe the father is God? And they'll say, yes. Do you believe the son is God? Sometimes they'll say no. And then I'll point them to the Book of Mormon where it says he's God. And other times they'll say, uh, well, then they don't know what to do, right? Uh, other times they'll say, yes, he is a God, but he's not the God of this world. The Father's the God of this world, right? So uh, now they're in a real quandary, though, because the Book of Mormon not only says Jesus is God, it says that he's the God of this world. It says he's our God. Now, later Mormon literature goes on and gets even wilder. In fact, if you read the Book of Mormon closely, it's actually modalistic. The Book of Mormon actually teaches that Jesus is the Father. As Joseph Smith's theology developed, he came to believe in tritheism, that the Father, Son, and Spirit were separate gods. And then eventually he came to believe in full-blown polytheism and even deification, that human beings could become gods, rule over their own planets, and so forth. And so in this overall theology, the father himself became a god, as did his father before him, as did his father before him. And that's what Jesus was doing when he came to earth. He was coming to this world in order to do what his father did before him in order to become a god. But I mean, it all gets very convoluted because the, the sources are not consistent. So, so here's my point. I ask Mormons, are you keeping the first commandment? And if they say they are, then I say, which, which one is your God? If they say it's the father, I say, so then you don't worship Jesus. And, uh, they usually don't know what to do. They'll end up saying we worship the father and the son. Well, now they're worshiping two that their sources say are God. So they're worshiping two gods, in which case, if you're saved by your law keeping, or if you're saved by grace after all that you can do, and your theology requires you to break the first commandment, well, then now you've got a, a theology of salvation and a theology about God that conflicts with the, the very commandments that you're supposed to keep according to that theology of salvation. It, it's really a convoluted mess. Uh, I, I could go on with this, but I've got way too much still to cover, but I hope that gives you some idea. Believe me, if you broach this issue, they're going to be fumbling all over the place and you're going to notice holes in what they're saying, right? They're not going to know what to do with some of this, but it really helps to know their sources to know when they're not giving you the straight scoop. 
Uh, sometimes they'll say that we only believe in one God, and when all they mean is they only believe there's one God for this world. But then they can't tell you which God is the God for this world because their sources aren't consistent there. All right. Thank you, Al Crego. Al Crego says, would it have been rare or frequent for fishermen like John to know the Targum? I can imagine skeptics challenging the authenticity of John's writings, giving, given gospel John's familiarity with the Targums. So the point I made earlier is that the Targums represent what any Jew would have heard in synagogue. So, I mean, we're not just talking here about, it's not like some of these books you hear people talking very highly about things like, uh, I don't know, Enoch uh, or, and I'm not saying Enoch doesn't have in its own right some significance, but it's less likely that some Jews would have known about the book of Enoch than that they would have known about the Targums. Okay. The Targums represent popular Judaism. Okay, It was standard practice in the synagogue to read the text in Hebrew and then interpret it in Aramaic. And it's those Aramaic interpretations that are found in the Targums. So this was just popular Judaism. Every Jew would have had the Targums ringing in his ears. Okay, No, no Jew, when they read John's Gospel, like you have somebody like to Tobias Singer pretending like, oh, this, what is this? This word, you know, where does this come from? Right. No Jew in the first century was like, what's this John guy talking about? In fact, you know, everything John says through verse 13, every Jew could have heard and said, oh, yeah, that all makes sense. I, I've already heard all this. Right. Uh, even that stuff about John wouldn't have been too troublesome to them, right? When it says that there came a man sent from God whose name was John, who came to testify and so forth. Many Jews celebrated John. They thought John was a prophet. But in any case, the, the real stumbling block to Jews is verse 14, right? That's a point that Boyerin makes. It's not the first 13 verses of John's gospel, right? Not even you know, verses 10, 11, and so forth, because, the, well, I don't, I don't want to get into too much to exegeting the prologue, but the incarnation, some people think they're seeing allusions to the incarnation earlier in John 1, but the incarnation is in verse 14, okay? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. What you see prior to that is talking about the logos asarkos, meaning the logos without flesh, before he became flesh. When it says that he was, uh, the world became through him, he was in the world, and the world didn't know him, he came to his own, and his own didn't receive him, I would maintain that's not yet talking about the incarnation when Jesus went in the flesh to Israel. That's talking about the prior uh, activity of the word in the world, and in particular in Israel, uh, and they don't receive him which necessitates the incarnation. Okay, but that, that'll take too long to get into. But if you if you want to check some of that out, uh, read Boyeran's article in here uh, where it, uh, it's called The Intertextual Birth of the Logos. Uh, he talks about that at length. But the, the short answer to your question would be uh, that every Jew would have heard this in synagogue. Okay, the memra was not some esoteric fringe idea. It was common everyday Judaism. Targum of Onkelos was an official Targum, and all throughout the Targum of Onkelos, uh, it makes reference to the Memra. So I'm, I'm, I'm saying that, you know, that Targum had official status, right? And other Targums had more currency in Palestine, like Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, uh, Targum Neophyte, Right, but they all make reference to the Memra. All right. Okay, did I miss any? All right, I hope I didn't miss any. Hopefully my mods... Oh, wait, here's one. Walter says, love your work, Anthony, especially the Galatians series. Please keep that coming. This is good, too. <laughs> I'm glad this is good, too, and I hope it gets better. Um, yeah, so Slam is reminding people that just came in Oh, and she's showing you where the clip is or the, the YouTube link is. Um, so I 
I played at the beginning, for those that got here late, a clip from Tobias Singer uh, arguing that Genesis 1 and John 1 uh, are worlds apart. John 1 is a clear departure from the Old Testament in general, from Jude Jewish ideas uh, in general, and in particular from Genesis 1, what's going on there. Uh, I was just doing a setup now where I showed that the Old Testament text makes a number of ref references to the Debar, the word of the Lord, or the Kol Yahweh Elohim, the voice of the Lord, portrays God's word or voice in various contexts in personal ways. And I showed that the Targums, the Targumim, picked up on some of these things. And therefore, in their Aramaic renderings of the Old Testament, where they're also providing their exegesis or their exposition, they incorporate into various texts references to the Memra because they believe that these other places in the Hebrew text that talk about the word shed light on God's activity in other places. So, for example, if the Hebrew text in some place says God appeared to Abraham, because elsewhere in the Torah or the Tanakh as a whole, appearances of God to people are further identified as appearances of the word, like Genesis 15.1, they would use that as a cognomen, another way of referring to these appearances of a divine person. Okay, so I just show that that's just standard fare in Judaism. But now we're going to get into some really good stuff. Okay, now we're going to get into some really good stuff. I hope Toby is still watching. <laughs> you guys think Toby will watch this? All right. Who knows? All right. So there is this interesting statement in Jerome's Hebrew questions on Genesis. Now, I'm going to disagree with Jerome, but what's interesting is what he makes reference to and the prevalence of what he makes reference to. Okay, this is a statement that he makes on Genesis 1-1. Okay, in the beginning God created, or God made the heaven and the earth. As it is written in the dispute between Jason and Papiscus, and as Tertullian reckons in the book against Praxius, and as Hilary also asserts in the exposition of a certain psalm, most people think that in the Hebrew is contained in the Son God made heaven and earth, which the facts of the matter itself prove to be mistaken. Okay, so what he's saying here is that many people, in fact, most people, think that in the Hebrew is contained in the Son, God made heaven and earth. Now, Jerome disagrees with this. Now, it's uh, unclear to me whether he's ascribing this belief to Tertullian and Hillary because, uh, uh, in other words, uh, this can be read in more than one way. Is he saying that Tertullian and Hillary are examples of people who believe? That's what Genesis 1-1 says. Or is he citing Tertullian and Hillary as uh, people who refer to the fact that m most people believe this? Right, you could read that in two ways. And the reason I think that he's simply pointing to Tertullian and Hillary as people who mention that many people believe this rather than the, the idea that they themselves held this is because when you look at Tertullian's against Praxius, he doesn't actually advocate the idea that the Hebrew says, in the sun, God made heaven and earth. Right. Tertullian simply refers to the fact that some people have have said this. OK, but when you read Tertullian, it doesn't seem like Tertullian thinks that that's how you render uh, the Hebrew text. OK, now, as for Hillary, he says that this reference is found in his exposition of a certain psalm. Not all of Hillary's homily, homilies on the psalms are extant, and there's nothing in his extant. Uh, homilies on the Psalms that I could find that make reference to this statement, in the sun, God made heaven and earth. In any case, 
Jerome at least bears witness back in his day to the fact that most people think that the Hebrew contains in the sun God made heaven and earth. Now, where would people get such an idea? Okay. Now, I will tell you that if we're just talking about a straightforward translation of the Hebrew, that it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. No ambiguity there. Barashit bara Elohim et hashamayim va et ha'aretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Okay. That's what it says. However, <laughs> there's more to be said. Okay. Uh, here's the rest of his quotation, real quick. He says, both the Septuagint, Symmachus, and Theodosian, those are other Greek translations, translated it as in the beginning. And in the Hebrew is written Barashit, which Aquila understands as in the chapter, and not Ba then, which would mean in the sun. Okay. So Ba would be the, the bait preposition in and ben the word for sun. So in the sun. Okay. So it doesn't say ba ben, right? In the sun. It says barashit in the beginning. Okay. So Jerome tells us, no, the Hebrew doesn't say that. However, most people, according to Jerome, think that it says in the sun, God made heaven and earth. Where, oh, where would he get such an idea? Well, don't jump the gun yet. This isn't, this isn't yet where I'm getting to, but this is my copy of Ankylos. Okay. Here's what it says. Here's how it renders Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, the Lord created the heaven and the earth. Okay. It gives a very straightforward uh, rendering in Aramaic that comes into English in the same way as, as we would render it from the Hebrew text. So the, the standard uh, Targum of Babylonian Jewry simply gives us a straightforward interpretation or translation. Okay. Now, down here, it says, Onkelos translates the phrase literally and avoids theology. The Targumist, as translator, also does not introduce Midrashic interpretations, which Rashi does, or mystical notions, as Nachmanides does, regarding the nature of creation or why it was necessary for the Torah to describe it at all. Okay, so it's noting here that Anchalos is just giving us a straightforward rendering, but it's acknowledging that there are uh, other statements that introduce midrashic interpretations. Midrash refers to exposition. Uh, usually involves, the best of midrash involves finding a text elsewhere in the Bible for which we can demonstrate a textual link between it and some other text such that it legitimately serves as an interpretive key. Okay, I'm going to show you how this is done in a moment, but in the first place, I just note that this Targum just gives us a straightforward rendering of Genesis 1. Here is my copy of Targum Pseudo Jonathan. Targum Pseudo Jonathan, in the translation they're giving us here, it says, At the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, they, already it looks a little different, okay? But the English rendering is not does not do justice to what the actual Aramaic says. If you look in the uh, footnote there, I've blown it up for you so you can see it. Look at the footnote there. It literally says, from the beginning. From the beginning. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here for just a moment. For just a moment. I just want to see... I just want to see how many might be picking up on something here. Okay. Genesis 1-1, the literal Hebrew text says, Barashit, in the beginning. Okay. Targum Onkelos renders it exactly that way in Aramaic. Targum Pseudo-Jonathan introduces a slight change. I suggest, I submit to you, 
that what Targum Pseudo Jonathan is doing at this point is he's reading something intertextually here. He's tipping his exegetical hand. It's going to become more explicit in a moment. He's tipping his exegetical hand. He's evoking another text when instead of saying in the beginning, he says from the beginning. Right? From the beginning. Where, where do we have the expression from the beginning in the Bible? I told you there are only two times when the Old Testament uses the phrase Roshit, beginning, in reference to creation. Okay? There's only one other time. It's Proverbs 8. Okay? We're, we're going to come to Proverbs 8 in a moment. But in Proverbs 8, it says that wisdom was there from the beginning, okay? And it's about creation, okay? So what I'm suggesting to you already is though there's only this very sparse uh, difference between Targum Pseudo Jonathan and the Hebrew text, it's already importing language from Proverbs 8, okay? Here's what the Jerusalem Targum says. In wisdom, the Lord created, and the earth was vacancy and desolation and solitary of the sons of men and void of every animal and the spirit of mercies from before the Lord breathed upon the face of the waters. Okay, now you see that the Jerusalem Targum in sync with what is only barely suggested in Targum Pseudo Jonathan, it goes a step further and understands that when God created the world, he did so in wisdom or more literally with wisdom. Okay. Hey, hey Jeff, good to see you. <laughs> That's my good friend, Jeff, uh, pastor friend. Uh, he, is my uh, forerunner at seminary. He graduated from the same seminary as I did several years before me. Um, but uh, he, we, I recently got my kids a puppy, and uh, I got it from the same breeder that he he had. Uh, I, I was at his house, um, well, several times, but uh, I think it was two times ago was the first time I saw the puppy. And then last time I saw the puppy again, and I thought, this is the perfect dog for them. <laughs> so thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I got that for my kids for my birthday. <laughs> my birthday was June 23rd, for those that don't know. <laughs> All right. So Targum of Onkelos, straightforward reading. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Targum Pseudo Jonathan says, uh, from the beginning, alluding to Proverbs 8. The Jerusalem Targum, a step further, says, with wisdom, God created the heavens and the earth. Oh, but we, we, haven't, even, we haven't even gotten to the, the really good stuff yet, folks. <laughs> Here's Targum Neophyte. This is Targum Neophyte. Targum Neophyte says, from the beginning, with wisdom, the word of the Lord created and perfected the heavens and the earth. Okay, now you've got the reflected here in the translation, the full understanding that was hinted at in Targum Pseudo Jonathan and the fragmentary Targums. They're reading Genesis 1 intertextually. They're reading it together with Proverbs 8. They're saying that Proverbs 8 has a definite bearing on our understanding of Genesis 1. But notice this. Okay, here it is, hopefully a little bigger for you. It says, From the beginning with wisdom, the memra, or word of the Lord, created and perfected the heavens and the earth. Notice that letter B right there. That's a reference to a footnote. Okay? Or to, uh, to the apparatus here. Look at what that letter B is a reference to. What it's telling you here is the original text said, in wisdom, 
the son of the Lord perfected. So in other words, uh, while, while this, uh, oops, sorry, I'll go back here. While they put in the, in the English translation from the beginning with wisdom, the member of the Lord, the original manuscript actually has in wisdom, the son of the Lord perfected. Okay. Now, some Jews try to argue that this is a later uh, interpolation. Okay. But I beg to differ. And I, I'm going to show you why that's, I think, the case. <laughs> But first, let me say something about Targums and Talmud, and then we're going to talk about Midrash. Okay. Some people will argue that the Targums are very late. Now, nobody denies that what I said earlier, that the Hebrew text was read in synagogue, then it was interpreted in Aramaic. And we, I mean, we even have some Targums in the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's a Targum on Job, for example. We know that Jews produce Targums. Problem, of course, is with most of stuff from antiquity, we don't have ancient manuscripts. We have old manuscripts. We don't have ancient manuscripts. And so some people try to argue that the Targums are later than they are. Well, there's, there's a fundamental, a huge problem with this. Okay, number one, it, it should already seem just incredible to think that the Targums coming along after the, uh, the time of Christ and, and Christianity's birth, right, the New Covenant Judaism, right, it's the fulfillment, I'm not saying it's new in the sense of it's a different fundamentally discontinuous religion from the Old Testament, right, it is fundamentally discontinuous with later Judaism, which is not Old Covenant Jewish religion, but when Christianity comes along and you've got the Apostle John and then the early Christians referring to Jesus as the Word, it, it's just, it would boggles the mind that anybody, and they, they usually don't think this through, but that if what they're saying is true, what they would be suggesting is not so much that John is taking commonly understood Jewish ideas and using them to express Christian convictions, but what, what this would entail if the Targums really are a product of post-Christian Judaism, it would entail, in effect, that the Jews were rather taking this idea of the word from Christians. Okay, I don't know anybody in their right imagination that would want to suggest such a thing. The fact of the matter is that Judaism, after the time of Christ, was trying to get away from this sort of thing. Okay, the, the movement is in exactly the opposite direction. Okay, let me show you some quotations from people on the Talmud, because it's it's quite obvious when you compare the Targums with the Talmud that there's something that looms large in the Targums that's altogether missing from the Talmud, okay? There's something that looms large in the Targums that's altogether missing from the Talmud. What do you think that is, okay? This is a quote from Alfred Edersheim. Oops, sorry, I think I did that wrong. I wanna do it like this. Um, so this is a quote from Alfred Edersheim. He's a famous Jewish convert to Christianity. He said, in the Talmudical writings, the, the Talmud is the rabbinic writings from like the third or second, let's say 200s to 500s. Okay, so from the 200s to 500s, they're compiling the Talmuds. I should say Talmuds because there's the Bavli, the Babylonian Talmud, and then there's the the uh, Palestinian Talmud. Okay. So two Talmuds. Now there's a lot of shared material between the two, but what's being stated here is true for both the Babylonian and Palestinian Talmud. He says in the Talmudical writings, we find mention not only of the Shem of name, but also of the Shekhanah. God is manifest and present 
which is sometimes also presented as the Ruach HaKodesh of Holy Spirit. But in the Targumim, we meet yet another expression, which, strange to say, never occurs in the Talmud. It is that of the Memra, Logos, or Word, not that the term is exclusively applied to the divine logos. So he's saying it's used in a variety of ways, but inclusive of the divine logos. He says, but it stands out as perhaps the most remarkable fact in this literature, Targumic literature, that God, not as in his permanent manifestation or manifest presence, but as revealing himself is designated memra or word. Okay. So here's Alfred Edersheim, one of the most informed uh, individuals with respect to Judaism of the Second Temple period, telling us that we have this strange phenomena that the Targum is chock full of references to the Memra, and yet when we turn to the Talmud, it's not there at all. Okay? One of the things it tells us is that those who produce the Talmud aren't responsible for producing the Targums, and those who produce the ta Talmud are clearly trying to uh, avoid and ignore altogether this talk about the Memra. Okay? This is one strong reason for saying that the Targums are ancient. Okay? Uh, here's another quote. This is from Eliakim and Roberts in a volume of The Living Age, volume 197. It says, in the pre-Christian Targums, there's a name for the word of God, Memra, which recurs hundreds of times. But from the Talmud, it has wholly disappeared. Evidently, to go on using it when Christians could point to its realization in a definite historical personage would have been in the highest degree dangerous to Pharisaic orthodoxy. Okay, so again, people recognizing this disparity. Targum Memra. Targum Memra. Hundreds of times. Talmud Memra who? Memra what? What are you talking about? We don't know what you're talking about. You know, Oive, Memra, who is this go Goy? You know, who is this Nudnik? <laughs> um, all right. Uh, this now, this, by the way, this is from the Jewish Encyclopedia. I gave you a reference there. This is Kaufman Kohler. He says, in the ancient church liturgy adopted from the synagogue, it is especially interesting to notice how often the term logos in the sense of the word by which God made the world or made his law or himself known to man was changed into Christ. Possibly on account of the Christian dogma, rabbinic theology outside of the Targum literature made little use of the term Memra. Okay, so what we've seen so far is, number one, Tobias Singer's wrong to say that this idea that God God's word was active in creation, is absent from the Old Testament in general, is flat wrong. We've seen that he's wrong to say that the only resemblance between John and Genesis 1 is the phrase, in the beginning, poppycock. There's numerous verbal correspondences between the two. It's obvious that John has is having you know recourse to Genesis 1 and wants us to read what he's saying in light of Genesis 1 and intends us to understand it as a inspired commentary or exegesis of all that's entailed in, in Genesis 1. Um, we've also seen that the Targums begin to show how Jews understood Genesis 1, and the, perhaps the main, not perhaps, actually is the main text that they viewed as being intertextually related to Genesis 1, okay? namely Proverbs 8. Now, we're going to come to that in a moment. Here is the Hebrew text on top with the vowel pointings. Underneath that is just the consonantal text. Okay, now I've explained this to people before. Uh, when Moses and the prophets wrote, they didn't include vowel pointings. They wrote in all consonants. Now, ordinarily, you could read right along if you're a native Hebrew speaker, not having vowels didn't cause you to stumble. Occasionally, there was some ambiguity where a person would have to pay close attention to the context in order to determine 
what the appropriate vowels were. You might think of this as, this is a very crude example, but you look at a license plate and the person has taken out all the vowels, but, but it still says something. Since you're a native English speaker, you can usually make out what the license plate means. The more context, the better, right? License plates are pretty small, but the more context, the better. Well, sometimes you look at a license plate and you can't figure it out. You know it says something, but you can't figure out what it is. If you had more context, you probably could, right? Well, for the most part, when you read the Old Testament, just looking at the consonants, there's nothing to, to stumble over. But there are occasions when there's some ambiguity. And there are occasions when more than one set of vowels would work, and that creates a quandary. But sometimes, from, from the Jewish perspective, it wasn't a quandary, rather it was a solution. Since the text could mean various things, it meant uh, that it potentially uh, another text where you had those same the same word, the same consonants and so forth used may be relevant in the interpretation of the text, either in bringing out a fuller meaning or what have you. In any case, well, let me just point out something just interesting for whatever it's worth. Um, uh, it's interesting to me. <laughs> if you look at the, the first letter, I mean, this is just just take this at, with a grain of salt. I'm not suggesting that you pour any significance into this. But maybe it'll help you to just sort of remember something about the text. <laughs> the first letter of the Hebrew sentence is bait. Okay, bait. That's the letter that begins the word for son, right? Ben. Ben is the word for son, right? Bene Elohim is sons of God, right? Um the next letter there is resh, which is the letter that begins the phrase ruach ha kodesh, the Holy Spirit. Right. The third letter is aleph, which is the first letter in the word ava for father. So you have the first letter for the word son, first letter for the phrase Holy Spirit, name Holy Spirit, and first letter for the word father. But what's interesting is although it's an entirely different word, but a sheet. Then the second word, bara, notice how the first three letters of the first word are all the letters of the second word, right? Even if you don't know Hebrew, you can see that those are the same letters, right? Bara, sheet, bara, right? So bara, sheet means in the beginning, bara means he created, okay? And then it's followed by the subject, Elohim, which means God. Okay, but the, it's very interesting. The Hebrew text has uh, Beit, Resh, Aleph, the first three letters of the first word. Then the second word is Beit, Resh, Aleph, right? Different vowel pointings, but uh, same, same letters. By the way, if you look at the first letter, Beit, and you count one, two, three, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? If you count seven letters, you come to Resh. So from Bet, to resh, seven letters, right? Then if you count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven letters, you come to Aleph. You have bait, resh, Aleph again. <laughs> now, I don't know what you want to make out of that. I'm just pointing it out to you because, well, I'll tell you this. Jewish people often try to make a lot out of these sorts of things. I'm not trying to tell you to pour any significance into that. I'm just drawing attention to it because you know, I'm a guy that likes to play with words. When I drive down the street, when I look at a word, I'm scrambling the word in my head, trying to come up with every possible word I can think of, right, from those letters, right? So when I look at something like this, that's just sort of natural to me to kind of notice this sort of thing. I, I just notice certain symmetry, certain patterns. That strikes me as at least interesting to note. But in any case, the first word is barashit, okay? The uh, word or the it means in the beginning, okay. Uh, the beginning of the word is uh, is not really part of the word. It's it's a preposition. It's known as a bait preposition, and it means in or with or at or something like that, right? Usually in or with, okay. So the word here is rashit. Now uh, the root word is resh or rosh, right? 
Now, how many of you have heard? How many of you have heard of Rosh Hashanah? Okay, this is going to tell you what the word means. How many of you have heard of the uh, Rosh Hashanah, or maybe they usually say Rosh Hashanah or something like that, but it's Rosh Hashanah, right? That is the way of referring to the new year uh, if you're Jewish. It literally means the head of the year, okay, the beginning of the year, right? The head of the year, the beginning of the year, Rosh Hashanah, okay, that's why Barashit means in the beginning, okay? At, at the head, at the beginning, okay? In the beginning. Now keep following me here, because all this is going to be necessary to what I'm going to show you. Okay, so the first word of Genesis is Rashit, with the bait preposition, in. And it, it comes from the root word Rosh. Okay, oops. I was going to show you a thing on what Midrash is, but I forgot to include the quote. So let me just kind of give you an idea of what Midrash is. Okay, Midrash, it's a long story in one sense. Here's the simple explanation. Midrash is like Jewish exposition. Some of it is just plain fanciful. Okay. Uh, there are stories that are told, and there's actually all kinds of different positions that Jews take with respect to these stories, some of these stories, right? So, for example, now, when I, when I read the Midrash, it seems evident to me that the rabbinic sages intended these things to be understood literally, okay? Now, when you look at uh, the Geonim, which refers to uh, Jews from like the 7th to the 11th century. They all took these things literally, okay? Following them, you have a group called the, the Tosafists, like men like Rashi and others, who also took it literally, but with this difference. The, the Geonim uh thought that certain things, so I mean, or even bef before the Geonim, it, it was all understood literally and taken as matter of fact, right? What these stories relate are true. That's, I mean, not just what they relate in some esoteric sense, but like on a surface level, what they're saying is true, right? So if, if, uh, you know, if, uh, if you read in these sources, for example, that Adam's head reached to heaven, and then when Adam sinned, God smushed him, right? That's what it says in some of these sources. God smushed him so that he was now smaller. That's where Muhammad picked up some of his crazy ideas, by the way. Uh, the earliest, when you read the Midrash, it seems like that's just literal. That just is, is a natural reading of it. The Geonim from the 7th to the 11th century understood them to intend this literally, but they, they thought that this meant, rather than we should accept whatever the Midrash say, we should take things, uh, we could sort of pick and choose, right? Because some of these things are too fanciful. They're clearly out of accord with what we've come to know to be the case, even at that stage in the game, scientifically, right? They knew that certain things stated in these sources just weren't true. And so they, they continued to think that the, the sages understood these things and intended them literally. However, the Geonim knew that it, they were wrong. And so when it came to certain things, they would say, no, we don't accept that. The Tosafists come to believe that uh, these things are literal and we're to take them for what they say, right? Um, but you start getting into this idea that what they're saying, it, it's like they're, they're trying to communicate an idea. And this especially comes along with Mahmanides uh, after them. Mahmanides really turns the tide where he wants to say that these things found in the Midrash are uh, 
are all true, but they're not intended in a mundane sense. So if it says Adam's 90 feet or not 90 feet, Adam's head reached to heaven. It's a way of saying that before the fall, Adam's intellect soared. And uh, after the fall, Adam is no longer uh, the genius that we used to think he was. Right <laughs> now, to me, when you read the Midrash and you see stuff like this, it can be entertaining. It can be interesting. Uh, and there may be some moral truth that you can learn from that. But there's other aspects of Midrash that I find to be very compelling and absolutely genius in terms of its insights, though sometimes it has to be tweaked. Sometimes it, it seems quite evident to me that what's going on in the Midrash, these expositions, what's going on in the Midrash is them tweaking a earlier and better insight held by their pre, uh, predecessors. And, and we're going to see an example of what I mean by this. Okay, We've already seen how the Targums treat this. They treat Genesis 1 as a reference to the word or wisdom of God who created everything. And the wisdom or word of God, according to the Targums, is a person. Okay, But wait till you see what happens in the Midrash. But uh, when I talk about the best of the Midrash, the kind of thing that I really like, is when they're engaging in what I've called intertextual exegesis. They're recognizing the clear lines that are connect different texts. Okay, think for example of, I've done some of this with you guys before. And, and by the way, uh, it, contemporary Old Testament scholarship has only been catching up with this in the past several decades, right? But it's really, really uh, led to a lot of uh, really good material. But uh, they're, they're really just catching up with what you could have already seen the Jews doing in the Midrash long ago. Okay, But, but here's an example of what I mean by intertextual interpretation. Uh, seeing two texts related to each other. It, it's long been argued that the Exodus is a kind of new creation event. Okay. God is, in a sense, creating a new people uh, and uh, a new world, in a sense, right? Um, not literally, but uh, uh, in some sense, Israel is experienced, well, let's put it this way. Um, when you look back at the flood, what's happening in the flood? In the flood, God destroys the world. He causes, he deluges it in water, right? But he delivers through the flood, Noah and seven others. So eight people. Right? That's why the number eight comes to represent new beginning. Okay, Eight, it's the start of a new week. Right, The eighth day is the start of a new week. It, God repopulates the world with those eight people. But at the flood, God deluges the world and delivers these people through it. And then he begins again with Noah and his sons. Noah is portrayed as a kind of new Adam. Right? What happens to Noah? Noah gets off the ark, and shortly thereafter, Noah imbibes the fruit of the vine a little bit too much, and he ends up drunk and naked, and it leads to that whole sordid affair there involving Canaan and so forth, right? But notice, you have this, this new figure uh, coming to a newly cleansed world, and just like Adam he, he partakes too much of the fruit and he and he uh, he sins right uh, leading to his son being cursed okay that that's a way of, of sort of recapitulating the original creation event well the Exodus is very much like that oh is the lizard king acting up I know he probably wants uh, attention um, stick around lizard king without being a nuisance and we can talk later but if he's, uh, that's that's not an indication, mods, that if he's acting up, you can't can him. You can can him if he acts up. 
But uh, if if you if you mind your p's and q's, Lizard King, I'm happy to talk to you towards the end. Um. All right. So when you look at G Genesis one, when God creates the world, it says, "In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth." And the Spirit of God was brooding across the surface of the deep, right? Uh, the, the world was shrouded in darkness, and the world was submerged in water, right? Uh, how does it go? It says, uh, and the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was brooding over the surface of the waters, right? It's only after that when God speaks, causing the dry land to appear, that the waters are parted, right? The waters are parted, the dry land appears, and then on the sixth day, God creates man. So what happened at the flood was God was, in effect, reversing creation in order to bring about a new creation. Okay. What happened at the time of the Exodus is similar. God is now, again, parting the waters so that his people can cross over on dry land into the promised land. So it's a kind of new creation event. Okay, that's why it's not surprising when you get to Genesis or excuse me, Deuteronomy 32. Moses teaches Israel a song. Moses teaches Israel a song. Listen to what it says in this song. This is only part of the song, but it, it's hearkening back to Israel's redemption. It says. Um, the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the allotment of his inheritance. He found him in a desert land and in the howling waste of a wilderness. Now, if you look at the Hebrew, it's the same language used back in Genesis to refer to the world as without form and void. Okay, So it's saying when God found Jacob in Egypt, he found him in the howling waste of a wilderness. It's likening the, the situation of Israel to the world before God filled and formed it, right? When it was in a state of uh, formlessness and void. But then it goes on to say, he encircled him, just like the text says, God set a circle on the earth. He cared for him. He guarded him as the pupil of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up its nest, that hovers or broods over its young. Remember Genesis 1, when it talks about the Spirit of God brooding over the waters? That, that word, by the way, is only used twice in the Torah, once in Genesis 1-2, once there in Genesis 32. So you have a cluster of words in Genesis 1 and Deuteronomy 32, one referring to the original creation, one referring to God's redemption of his people, a cluster of words, at least you know one of which is only used in these two places, and the others are, are only found together in these two places. That's what's known as an intertextual reference. It's obvious that this text in Deuteronomy 32 is in some way uh, related to what you hear in Genesis 1. And, and that's why scholars will say that the Exodus was a new creation event. God is bringing about uh, a new redemption or a redemption for Israel and, and making him his new people, right? He's, he's uh, beginning with them as his nation. Okay. Now this doesn't represent the consummated new creation, but it's one of the steps along the way. Like even, even now, while we're still looking forward to the consummation of the new creation, scripture says that right now, believers, what are a new creation in Christ Jesus, second Corinthians five seventeen. right? We are new creations in Christ Jesus. The new creation has come already even though it's not yet consummated, okay? So that's an example of intertextuality. When you see that kind of thing in the Midrash, that, I believe, is when the Midrash is at its best, okay? All right, now we're going to look at something the Midrash says. But first, I need to read this quote to you from... This is the introduction to... Uh, this is from the introduction to the uh, Midrash on Song of Songs. Okay. 
It says, the rabbis say, do not let this mashal, a mashal is like a, a proverbial saying, a pithy saying, a wise saying. So the sort of thing that you'll find in the book of Proverbs, in Ecclesiastes, in the Song of Solomon, right? It says, do not let this mashal be light in your eyes. It doesn't mean light in the sense of uh, photons or whatever. It's talking about light in the sense of weight, right? Don't let it be light in your eyes. The, the short, pithy sayings. Don't let this mashal be light in your eyes, for by means of this mashal, one comes to comprehend the words of Torah. A mashal to a king who has lost a golden coin from his house or a precious pearl, does he not find it by means of a wick worth a penny? So what it's saying is, you know, if a, if a king loses a coin, he'll light up a, a wick to find it. Now, the wick might only be worth a penny, but it helps him find a coin, a golden coin that's worth a lot. And so the, the, the introduction to the Song of Songs is saying, don't discount the importance of these pithy, proverbial sayings, because like a light that only the wick, a wick that costs a penny, these can be like lights or keys to interpret the Torah, right? Similarly, let not this mashal be light in your eyes, for by means of this mashal, one comes to comprehend the words of Torah. Know that this is so, for Solomon, by means of this mashal, understood the exact meaning of the Torah. Rabbi Judah says, it is to teach you that everyone who teaches words of Torah to the many is privileged to have the Holy Spirit descend upon him. From whom do we learn this? From Solomon, who because he taught words of Torah to the many, was privileged to have the Holy Spirit to, to descend upon him and utter three books, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. So I, I quote this because it's showing you something of how the Jews viewed books like Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. Right. And uh, uh, two other books like Ruth and so forth. They viewed these books as having special bearing on the interpretation of the Torah. Books that we're used to thinking of as light, even now, unless, except for like, uh, you know, I don't know. How many times do people think of the Song of Songs? Right. Maybe you think of Proverbs uh, more often than the others. But even then, you just think of it as maybe wise sayings. Um, it's good for practical wisdom and insight, but not for much more than that, perhaps. Every once in a while, you might get a theological nugget, but uh, you don't see it, per se, as together with Ecclesiastes and Song of Songs, especially important to the interpretation of the Torah. But that's what it says in the intro to the Midrash on Song of Songs. Uh, sometimes the Midrash is called, the, that I'm quoting from, is Midrash Rabbah. Okay, uh, midrash is the word for exposition. Rabbah means great. So it's the great midrash. So this is the midrash to the Song of Songs. Sometimes midrash is also called Agadah, okay, that refers to the stories that are told in midrash. All right, now get ready, folks. Here we go. First, I'm going to read for you something from Genesis Rabbah on Genesis 1. Now, it's very densely packed. I'm going to unpack it with you. So first, I just want to read through it. Understand, though, that uh, how this works. Midrash usually starts off talking about a text, and you may not initially understand what relevance this has to do with the text it's explaining. And if you don't understand by the time you get to the end, then you miss something, right? But... In this case, what's going on is the Midrash is picking up on certain verbal clues from Proverbs 8 and saying, this helps us to interpret Genesis 1. Okay, Now, here's the Midrash. Okay? It says, Rabbi Hoshea commenced his exposition thus. Then I was by him as a nursling, and I was daily all delight. Okay, so it's quoting Proverbs 8.30, and it's using this 
to exposit Genesis 1. It's taking it as a given here, but it doesn't tell you why it takes it as a given. I'm going to tell you why so that you're not entirely lost as we go along. The reason the Midrash thinks that Proverbs 8 is relevant to the interpretation of Genesis 1 is because both texts are talking about creation. Both texts have a number of verbal correspondences. Okay, I'm going to show you some of those later, but uh, the one that stands out foremost is it's the only other time in this context in Proverbs 8 when the word rashit for beginning is used in reference to creation. Okay, by the way, I think the, the full phrase in the beginning is only used like three times in Jeremiah, like Jeremiah 25, Jeremiah 26, Jeremiah 27, where it, it's used to refer to the in the beginning of the reign of King so-and-so, right? In the beginning of the reign of King so-and-so. So there's a few other references to the in the beginning phrase, but they're not referring to creation. This is the only time when Rashid is used again in reference to creation. So they take that as significant. And so they're saying Proverbs 8 helps to expound Genesis 1. So after quoting Proverbs 8, it begins to explain possible meanings of the word aman. Okay, remember in the Hebrew text, it, it would have just been written in all consonants. And so you're going to see here various potential meanings for these consonants since the, the vowel pointings are not also part of the original text, right? So it says here, aman means tutor or uh, uh, nurse, right? Like uh, uh, one who nurses another. It, it, the way it's translated in the first verse here is nursling, one who nurses, like from another, but it, it's also used in the sense of the one who nurses, right? The nourishes or tutors another. One who uh, nurtures, brings up, right? Aman means covered. Aman means hidden. And some say Aman means great. Okay, now they proceed to give you the evidence for this from various passages. Amon is a tutor, as you read, as an omen or nursing father carrieth the suckling child. So Numbers 11, 12 is a place where the same consonants are used, and there it's used in the sense of a nursing father carrying a suckling child. Okay, Amon means covered, as in the verse ha, ha emun, uh, excuse me, ha emunim, they that were clad, that is covered in scarlet. Lamentations 4, 5. Aman means hidden, as in the verse, and he concealed. Uh, omen, Hadassah. Okay. Uh, Aman means great, as in the verse, art thou better than no Aman, Nahum 3, 8, which is rendered, art thou better than Alexandria the Great that is situated among the rivers. Another interpretation, Aman is a workman. The Torah declares, I was the working tool of the Holy One, blessed be he. Now, what is that a quotation from? That's They're suggesting that as the translation of a portion of Proverbs 8, right? Uh, in Proverbs 8, now it doesn't make much sense because Amon means workman, but because they want it to refer to the Torah, instead of calling it a workman, they call it a working tool, <laughs> right? So they, they played a bit of a, a, a you know bait and switch there. But anyways, we'll come back to that. It says, the Torah declares, I was the working tool of the Holy One, blessed be he. Now note, now note the illustration here. This is, this is grand. In human practice, when a mortal king builds a palace, he builds it not with his own skill, but with the skill of an architect. The architect, moreover, does not build it out of his head, but employs plans and diagrams to know how to arrange the chambers and the wicket doors. Thus, God consulted the Torah and created the world. While the Torah declares, in the beginning God created beginning referring to the Torah as in the verse, the Lord made me as the beginning of his way. Okay, Proverbs 8, 22. All right, so here you see several references to Proverbs 8. There you have the explicit reference to the beginning. The Midrash here is interpreting this as a reference to the Torah. So it's saying the Torah was there with God in the beginning. The Torah existed before creation, right? And together, it with God created the world. And now the illustration it uses is of a, uh, 
a king using an architect to build, but it suddenly has to shift because it wants it to be about the Torah to speaking of the Torah as more like a tool than as an actual agent. Although there's a lot of statements in the Targums, or excuse me, the Talmud, no, excuse me, the Midrash, <laughs> where the Torah uh, is often portrayed in personal terms. But, but here's the, the first thing that I want you to get. The fact that the Midrash recognizes the relationship between Proverbs 8 and Genesis 1. There are these verbal cues that relate these two texts. Okay. Now, uh, I'm going to skip past this part. I want to read to you, this is from the Kleinman edition of Barashit Rabbah, all right, Genesis Rabbah. Um, so it's the Kleinman edition, which I'm going to blow it up here in a minute, but on the left side, it has, in the larger Hebrew characters, that's, that's the text, the portion of the Midrash, uh, that on the right side of the page, if you look at the right side, you'll notice that some English and Hebrew words are bold. They're bold. That's that's the English translation of the Midrash. Okay. So if you go back to the left side of the page, the big Hebrew characters are the portion of the Midrash that's under discussion. To the immediate right of the Midrash is the commentary of a rabbi and I forgot which rabbi it is, to the left of it is the commentary of Rashi. Okay. Now, to the on the outside columns, you have additional notes and so forth. Okay. We're not so much going to focus on the left side right now. But uh, here's what I want you to see. Um, wait, where am I going? Is it? Okay, here we go. Notice that it says, so the, the rest of this is... Uh, uh, incorporate, you know, it's it's the midrash with uh, additional Jewish comments interspersed along with it to help fill out the meeting, uh, the meaning. Okay, it says the sages of mid of the midrash would routinely introduce their discourses with a quote from scripture. After expounding the quoted verse, they would conclude their introduction with an insight that the citation provided into the topic of their discourse. Introducing this pattern, the Midrash here cites several such introductions to our scriptural passage. It begins by expounding a verse from Proverbs, the final interpretation of which will serve to clarify our verse. Okay, then it quotes the Midrash. Ravi Hoshea, the great opened, right? Ravi Hoshea, Rava, so forth, right? Ravi Hoshea, the great opened his discourse on our passage with the following exposition. Then you have the Hebrew of the uh, Midrash again. The Torah describes the, its relationship with God before the advent of creation. I was then his Amon, right? I was then his delight day after day, etc. The word Amon can be interpreted as related to Omain, which means a nurse, so that the Torah is saying, I was then his nursling. Amon can be interpreted as covered. Amon can be interpreted as hidden. Now, before moving on, um, notice... Uh, Notice in the notes down there, number three, it says, the word amon, according to this interpretation, is the subject of the, vow, uh, of the noun omain. In the pre-creation era, and indeed up until the giving of the Torah at Sinai, the Torah was with God as a royal prince is with a nurse, reared as it were by God himself. <laughs> During this time, now, now, I, I, what I'm hoping you guys are sort of seeing is, it sounds a whole lot like what the midrash is doing. On the one hand, is right in seeing Proverbs eight as related to Genesis one, but it's making a wrong turn. It's taking what should have been understood as earlier Jews did as a reference to the Word, whom I'm also ultimately going to show you is the Son. Right, that what what was originally understood by the Jews as a reference to God's memra, the Son, was eventually transferred to the Torah. They still retain a lot of the language that would have been legitimately used or more legitimately used for the Son. But notice they're talking about the Torah here as a royal prince with a nurse, reared as it were by God Himself. During this time, 
God guarded it and waited for a fitting recipient who would care for it after him. <laughs> Alternatively, it is the Torah that's likened to a nurse who raises the children of a king, meaning that it raises the one who studies it by guiding him in the right path. This approach will be followed in the insights after notes 5 and 12 below. So that's what I was referring to before when I said, uh, when it refers to the word Ammon as a uh, nursling, it, it makes more sense to say, like nursing father, right? Because that's how it's used elsewhere. Um, and so wisdom who's speaking in Proverbs 8 is being portrayed as the one who nurtures and raises people, okay? In any case, um, here's how it goes on. I want to get to this part. Um, another interpretation, the word aman, is to be understood in the sense of uman, a craftsman. Thus, in this verse, the Torah declares, I was the craftsman's tool. No, it doesn't mean craftsman's tool. They're, they're, again, playing games here. So to speak, in the hands of the Holy One, blessed is he through which he created the world. Right? Notice at the beginning of it, it says, Uman means craftsman. Right? They take the further step and say, when they want it to refer to Torah, craftsman's tool. But that's not what it says. Anyways, uh, the Midrash explains this concept by means of a parable. In the usual practice of the world, when a king of flesh and blood builds a palace, he does not construct it based on his own knowledge, but based on the knowledge of a craftsman. And the craftsman, likewise, does not construct it based on his own knowledge. Rather, he has papers. Um, oh, looks like I didn't include the rest here. In any case, okay, keep all this in mind. Here's Proverbs 8. It says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I maintain that the Hebrew word kana here means possessed, not made or created. And I'll hopefully say more about that if I remember. But uh, whenever you look at this word in the Old Testament, it the only times where, well, first of all, the meaning of it is clear in the vast majority of cases. It means to possess or acquire. There are some occasions when it could mean, it would make sense to mean create. Okay, now understand this distinction because so many people make a misstep here. Some people therefore conclude that the word means create in some context. That's not what that means. Okay, the only certain meaning of the word is to possess or acquire. All that the observation is showing when you say that in some context it could mean make or create is that that would make sense in those contexts. Where, But we only know for certain that it means possess or acquire. Right Now, there, none of those passages, those few passages where it could mean create, does it have to mean create? Okay, So it, it's not definitive, it's not conclusive that the word ever means create. But it is conclusive that it, regularly means to possess or acquire. Okay, So it says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way, before his works of old. From eternity I was established from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. When there were no ocean depths, I was born. When there were no springs abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was born. While he had not yet made the earth and the fields, nor the first dust of the world, when he established the heavens, I was there. When he inscribed a circle on the face of the deep. Oop. Notice the word beginning. I guess I forgot to tell you <laughs> to note that. Um, when he made firm the skies above, when the springs of the deep became fixed, when he set a boundary for the sea so that the water would not violate his command, when he marked out the foundations of the earth, then I was beside him as a master workman, a master craftsman. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the world, his earth, and having my delight in the sons of mankind. Now then, sons, right? That's one reason for saying that the phrase for uh, nurse really is nursling father Right? He's not the one nursing, but the one who's nurturing others. He calls them sons. Now then, sons, listen to me, for blessed are those who keep my ways. Listen to instruction and be wise and do not neglect it. 
Blessed is the person who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at my doorposts. For one who finds me finds life and obtains favor from the Lord. But one who sins against me injures himself. All those who hate me love death. All right. So we've seen that the Targumim incline to the understanding and come out right and say it, that the intertextual relationship between Proverbs 8 and Genesis 1 yields the conclusion that it was God's word, his personal word, his memra, even his son, according to Targum Neophyte, who created the world, or his wisdom, right? Word, wisdom, son. We've seen that in the later Talmudic period, with the rise of the, the Midrash and other things, that things during that same period when the Talmud is suppressing all talk of the Memra, that the Midrash gives a very similar interpretation in, in the sense that it thinks it still thinks of Proverbs 8 as the intertext to Genesis 1, only it now transfers to Torah what had earlier been ascribed to the Memra, the Son, the wisdom of God, okay? What I want to do now first is show you that these two texts are intertextually related for more reasons than I've just said, but then show you why the case is so much better by far and away that it points to the Son, the Memra, that rather than to the Torah, okay? Here are just some of the words that occur in both texts. Genesis and Proverbs both use the phrase Roshit for beginning. Both use the phrase for heavens and earth, Eretz. Uh, both have the same, not just the same word for the deep, but upon the face of the deep, right? Uh, Alpanim to home. Uh, it, uh, both have reference to the waters, to day, to maid, to sea, to man, right? The number of intertextual references here is off the charts. Okay, and so when you not only have a whole cluster of words found in two different contexts, that's that's already pretty good that we're dealing with an intertext, a cotext, something to be read together. But when then you also have, in addition to that, an entire phrase that's found in these two texts upon the face of the deep, and you have a word like beginning, Roshit, that's only used in these two places in reference to creation, I mean, this is like intertextual gold. It doesn't get better than this. This is the very fiber of what intertextuality is made out of. Okay, That's why uh, the Midrash couldn't even shake this idea. right? And the later rabbis, Rashi and others, for, for as much as it would have benefited them to try and get away from this whole idea, because it's, it's, it sounds a whole lot like Christianity, right? Albeit tweaked. Uh, but if they could have gotten away with this, they would have, or away from this, they would have. But they didn't. It was entrenched in Judaism. The best they could do was start talking about Torah instead of Memra. But now let's let's consider how this text points to the Son, the Messiah. The first thing I want you to note is the word possessed. Okay. That word possessed is often used in birthing or begetting contexts. Okay, I'll come to one prominent example of that in a moment. But you also have this word, I was born. In the Greek version, it says, I was begotten, right? And it's even repeated here. Um, let's see. Oops, I forgot to put it in. How bad of me. <laughs> okay, so I intended to put in here. When it says the Lord possessed me, it's the Hebrew verb kana. Okay. When it says, uh, when there were no depths, I was brought forth, it's the Hebrew word. Uh, well, it comes from the word cool. Uh, and it's the same down in verse 25. Okay. Well, here I put, uh, here's an example of how the word cool, which is used back here in Pro or Proverbs 8. Notice in, in Deuteronomy 32, 18, God says of Israel, you neglected the rock who begot you. That's a form of the word yalad, yaladka, begot you, right? So yalad is the 
typical word for begetting. Uh, but notice how it's used in parallel with the Hebrew word cool, right? And forgot the God who gave you birth. Okay, so here you have the word cool used synonymously or in parallel with yalad. Okay, so it's very obvious that, that when, when Proverbs 8 says, uh, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. This is begetting language, okay? And it's poetic, of course. It's referring to the, the begetting of this one before any creation came into being. This one was there. He was begotten, right? Uh, here's another example uh, of cool being used with begetting language, Job 39. It says, do you know the time the mountain goats bear young? So that's a form of the uh, word yalad. Can you mark when the deer bring forth, right? So again, it's from the word cool. Can you count the months they fulfill, or do you know the time they give birth? Okay, again, a form of the word yalad. Okay, and then it goes on. They kneel down, they're young, they bring forth. So the word cool that's used there in Proverbs 8 with respect to wisdom, who is there with God in the beginning, is birthing language. But it obviously is referring to something that is pre-temporal, something that uh, is a reality before the spatio-temporal world comes into being. In other words, in eternity. Here's Isaiah 51, 2, using the word cool again. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave birth to you in pain. So if we rendered it literally, it would be who brought you forth in pain. But it's obviously being used here in a birthing sense, right? So again, I'm just showing that this word is associated with birth in various places. Now I want to show you something uh, about the word kana. But in order to do that, I need to show you something about uh, Genesis 3.16 uh, before I get to Genesis 4.1. Um, in the context, starting in verse 14, it says, The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Okay. Notice it's speaking about her seed. It goes on to say, He singular, he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel. Now, re remember that because verse 16 is, is what I really want to look at, but I think its connection to verse 15 is critically important. And at verse 16 is hotly disputed and the disputants are all wrong. <laughs> you often see verse 16 where it says, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Okay, You often see people disputing this text. If you look at different translations, you could get different ideas. Some people think the text is saying that women, it's, it's descriptive, right? Women will desire to lord it over their husbands, but their husbands are going to dominate them right? It's not saying that you should do this. It's just saying this is what's going to happen, right? Women are going to try and be bossy and men are going to try and rule with an iron fist, right? That's the way some people take this text. Other people understand this as uh, uh, prescriptive. It, it's not just saying what in fact will happen, but it's saying women will want to be in charge, but instead the men will be in charge, right? And so you can see this this factors into debates between, you know, egalitarians, complementarians, feminists, and so forth. Now, I am uh, far from thinking the Bible doesn't speak to those issues. I think it does. But I don't think this text has anything to do with that. And, and I'm, I'm hoping I can uh, kind of at least get you thinking along uh, why this would be so. But it, at least uh, at least follow me here for a moment. Okay, M my contention is that the phrase that's translated "your husband," which is ishka in Hebrew, 
actually means your man. The, the Hebrew word ish means man. The ka at the end means your. So the literal rending, rendering is your man. Now, it is true that if you're talking to a woman, often saying your man, even in Hebrew, refers to the woman's husband. Okay. But that's a matter in my mind for, in, in, in uh, you know, exegesis. You got to exegete that. The, the literal meaning of the phrase is your man. Okay. That's what it means. Ish means man. The ka at the end means your. Ish ka, your man. My contention is that contextually, what this is saying, following hard on the heels of verse 15, where God promises to Eve a seed, saying that he will bruise the serpent on the head, whereas the serpent will bruise him in the heel. And then God says to the woman, I'm going to increase your pain in childbirth, and in pain you're going to be uh, bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your man, and he will rule over you. I, I think that verse 16 is still talking about the promised seed. It's telling the woman that she's going to have pain in childbirth, but she will endure, she will continue, because this is her ultimate desire, namely to bring forth the promised seed. Okay, And he will rule over you. Where have you heard that expression before? It's found throughout the Old Testament, and it's usually referring to kings. Uh, and it, it, it's even, I mean, it's the same phraseology used for Joseph, right, where his brothers say, you know, will you rule over us, right? I maintain, and, I, and hopefully what I'm going to go on to say will show you why this makes even more sense, but I maintain that verse 16 is not talking about marital relations. It's not saying that... Uh, either descriptively or prescriptively, anything about the relationship between husband and wife. It's talking about the coming seed. He's called your man. Okay. Now watch what happens in Genesis 4.1. Okay. This is Genesis 4.1 in many English translations. Okay. It says, the man knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Now go back for a second, actually. If what I'm saying is true, that God was saying, her desire would be for the man, your man, and he's going to reign over her, right? The one who will defeat Satan and so forth. If that's right, then what would Eve naturally be desiring? And what would Eve be anticipating? And what would Eve, upon becoming pregnant, be inclined to think with respect to her child? Hey, just, just think about that for a moment. You look at Genesis 4.1. It says, the man knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain. And she said, I have acquired a man child with the help of the Lord. Okay, now, you're probably wondering why I'm bringing this verse up. It's because the word acquired there is the same word kana. I'm going to come to that in a moment. I just want you to know why, why I'm even bringing this verse up. It's the same word used in Proverbs 8.22. But isn't it strange that it says here a man child with the help of the Lord? What does it mean to give birth to a man child? <laughs> Well, uh, in the first place, it doesn't say that. It says, I have acquired a man with the help of the Lord. Okay, The Hebrew text is quite odd here. Check the commentators. They'll all tell you when it comes to this statement, this is odd, that she's giving birth to this child, or she's acquired this child, but she calls him a man, ish. I have acquired a man. Okay. Now, there's something else that's curious about the text. You'll notice that the phrase with uh, or the help of is italicized. That's not because I italicized it. It's not because I'm emphasizing it. The phrase, the help of, is actually not there in the Hebrew. Okay, Taking that out, what we have now is, I have acquired a man with the Lord. Now, once again, check the commentators. I'm... Uh, <laughs> I did a whole show on this, by the way, a long time ago. Two, two episodes. Commentators fall all over themselves trying to make sense out of this. And I'll tell you why they're falling all over themselves. It's because, here's what it actually says. Uh, well, not what it actually says, but I want to show you what. Here's what the Hebrew uh, mark is that is being translated as with. Okay? I have acquired a man with the Lord. 
And th that doesn't make a lot of sense. And you see a lot of disputes. That's why they want to add uh, words to complete what they think is the intended sense. The problem is that little mark right there. Let me show you how this mark is used. It's, it is the direct object marker. Okay. It means that it is placed between the subject and the object. Or, I mean, it's placed before the object of the sentence. Okay. So he, here's the whole set. Uh, here's the first two verses of Genesis 4. The man knew Eve, his wife, she conceived in Borcane. Okay. There is that mark in between the phrase in Hebrew, the man knew. So knew is the word yada, and it's followed by Eve, his wife. Okay. In other words, it's not translated because it's it's not a word that's supposed to be translated. It's it serves a grammatical function. It tells you that what follows is the direct object. When it says the man knew, then it has the direct object marker, Eve his wife. The man knew Eve his wife. That's the function of that mark. Hey, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you an interlinear in a second, where they recognize this at all the wrong. Uh, well, just hold off. There's another time when it uses this in the same sentence here. It says she conceived and bore Cain. In between the word bore in Hebrew and Cain is this mark of the accusative, the direct object marker. It's indicating that Cain is the object of the sentence. I have acquired, uh, or excuse me, and she conceived and bore Cain. Okay. Cain is preceded by the direct object marker, indicating that he's the one that was conceived and uh, whom Eve bore. Right. Why don't they translate it as with in these cases? In fact, they don't translate it at all because it's not a word. It's the direct object marker. However, here's the word again. And suddenly you have, I have acquired a man, direct object marker, followed by the Lord. And instead of taking it as the direct object marker, they understand it to be a preposition, the word with. But notice the first two occurrences are, are taken as the direct object marker in all English translations. In this third instance, suddenly they don't take it that way. Well, here's another instance in the same two sentences. Again, she bore, direct object marker, his brother Abel. Okay, it's not translated with. It's not translated at all. It serves a grammatical function. It's not a word to be translated. It's used a fifth time. <laughs> Again, she bore, direct object marker, his brother, direct object marker, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks and so forth. So notice this. It's used five times in two verses, twice before and twice after the statement, I have acquired a man with the Lord. In none of the other cases is it translated as with. Only here, in, in, in the third occurrence. Why? Because what would it say if you take out the word with and treat the direct object marker the way it's treated in all other occurrences? <laughs> if you took that out, right, well, here's sort of a visual of what this looks like. You have the arrows, right? The, the arrow is a way of indicating the direct object marker. The man knew arrow, Eve, his wife, right? She conceived and bore arrow, Cain, right? Uh, and so on. Well, if you take out the word with, here's what it says. She said, I have acquired a man, the Lord. Okay. Now, the reason, the reason people don't like translating it this way is because, well, first of all, Jews don't like that because, well, that just looks like Christianity, doesn't it? It looks like Eve was expecting a divine Messiah. It looks like Eve having heard the promise of God, it's still ringing in her ears, conceived a child and believed this was the fulfillment of the promise. And she believed that she had conceived, she had acquired, that she was now in possession in some sense of a man who is the Lord. That's the most natural, contextual understanding of it, but it's theologically objectionable to anti-Messianic, anti-missionary Jews. 
And it's also something that even some Christians will look at and say, oh, Eve couldn't possibly have known this way back then. Says who? Who told them how much knowledge Eve had? If you look at the, the rest of the narrative in Genesis 4 and 5, the patriarchs sure seem to know a whole lot more than we give them credit for. In fact, let me just give this one example. Maybe I'll give two. Two examples. Uh, when the father of Noah named him, it says he named him Noah because he says in, in his days, uh, God will bring us rest from the land, the ground which God had cursed, right? So Noah's father makes explicit reference back to Genesis 3 when God cursed the ground. And God promised to bring deliverance. So Noah's father foresees in Noah at least a precursor of that more ultimate deliverance, but certainly uh, some temporal deliverance. In fact, even before Noah's father, Methuselah was named by his father, and Methuselah's name means in his uh, death it will come, right? The flood came the year that Methuselah died. And it was Noah who brought rest. Uh, so all of this is, is playing off of the messianic hope that was expressed in the garden. People in the period of the antediluvian seem to have a whole lot more sophisticated theology than we give them credit for. And prophetic insight. Moreover, uh, who, who's, who's to say that Eve couldn't have believed that the coming Savior would be God when Enoch mentioned in Genesis 5, one of the antediluvians is said to have foretold the second coming of Christ, according to Jude, right? Jude tells us that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied the return of the Lord, right? So if Enoch is prophesying the second coming, I, I, I don't know who, who, in the, who gets the right to tell us that Eve couldn't possibly be aware of the, uh, the incarnation of the Son. In any case, let, here, here is, this is Bible Hub. You could go right on Bible Hub and look at this. This is the Hebrew of Genesis 4.1. Remember, Hebrews read from right to left. And it says, Adam knew, right? Adam yada, and the man, really, and the man knew direct object marker. Notice underneath it, it says direct object marker right? Direct object marker. And then it goes on. His wife, and she conceived and bore, notice, direct object marker, Cain, and said, I have acquired a man. Oops. Now, notice, suddenly the same mark is not the untranslatable direct object marker. Suddenly they have it as from, or in some translations, with, right? Now we go to Genesis 4, 2. And, and she again bore et, right? Uh, that's the, the way of pronouncing it, et. It's a, the direct object marker, his brother, et, Abel, direct object marker. So in, in five occurrences, they recognize that it's the direct object marker every time except when you get to that one line. Uh, and by the way, if I were to do this, watch, in fact, why don't I do this? I'm going to stop here for a second. Um, why don't I do this? I'm going to show you. No, I, I'm not going to do it. It would take too long. But but let me just tell you this. If it is the case that as you get later into the Hebrew text, the the, the direct object marker is often translated with. Okay. But that's not its primary significance, and many would argue, in fact, the Jews argued, this created big trouble for them. I'm going to show you it in a second. But many Jews argue that it always refers to the direct object marker, and that with is supplied in those cases from some other aspect of the, of the sentence. In any case, though, if you look at the first 49 occurrences of the direct object marker in the Hebrew text, Every single time it's treated as the direct object marker, never as the preposition. This 50th occurrence, I went through and counted them one time. Genesis 4.1 is the 50th occurrence of the direct object marker. In all prior occurrences, it's never translated as with or from. 
it's always treated as the direct object marker. So the text read naturally, contextually, and grammatically, following it out from Genesis 1-1 all the way up to Genesis 4-1, literally says that Eve said, I have kana, I have acquired a man, the Lord. Okay. In fact, there are at least two Targums that understand this as the direct object marker. And there is, uh, if you look at various Greek translations, if you look at uh, Origins Hexapla, he even shows Greek translations where it's rendered as uh, the direct, well, Greek doesn't have a direct object marker, but the, the construction of the sentence in Greek yields the, the statement, I have begotten a man, the Lord, right? Or in, in the Greek, uh, it says, I've begotten a man, God, right? So, it, very interesting. The first occurrence of the word kana used for wisdom in Proverbs 8 is in a birthing context where it refers, if we take the verse literally, to the one who's conceived and born, at least in Eve's estimation, she turns out to be horribly mistaken, but in Eve's estimation to be the conception and begetting of God in her womb. Okay? All the way back in Genesis. So that's one word used for wisdom in Proverbs 8. Remember, my the point that I'm making now is that the Midrash is right to recognize the intertextual relationship between Proverbs 8 and Genesis 1. However, it's a departure from what we find in the Targums. It's theologically motivated, of course, because this earlier view of Jews is no longer palatable and moreover caters to Christianity. So they begin to transfer to Torah the things originally assigned to the Memra. What I'm showing is that these expressions with respect to wisdom are much more naturally references to the memra or wisdom of God than they are to the Torah, as viewed as a person, right, the, the memra. And the memra is ultimately to be identified with the Messiah or the Son. Okay, much more to go. Okay, so here, here it is in the Hebrew. It says the man knew his wife or knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bore Chayen, Chayen, right? It sounds like the, the verb Chana, Chayen, right? And then it says, I have acquired, Chaniti, a man, the Lord. So this is all a play on words. Eve refers to him as Chayen, possessed or acquired, saying I have acquired or I possess a man, the Lord. Okay. It's the same word used in Proverbs 8.22. Yahweh Kanani, Yahweh possessed me. Roshit, right? Yahweh possessed me from the beginning, right? Uh, so it's the same word used in Proverbs 8.22 and Genesis 4.1. All right. Now, notice this. This is also from Midrash Rabbah. Let's see. Do I get bigger here? Here we go. Notice on the left side where it says, saying, I have acquired a man with Hashem. Okay, if you, what they're trying to do here is they're trying to explain the term man. Why does Eve say I've acquired a man, <laughs> right? That seems weird. I already pointed that out. It, it's not the normal way you'd speak. You don't say I acquired a man, uh, but a child or a, a baby or something like that. Uh, so the Midrash is trying to explain it. When a woman sees that she has given birth to children, she says, I have now acquired my husband, right? So they're, they're trying to say that it, it's a reference to uh, uh, the husband. Um, but uh, wait, let me see. The Hebrew kind of neat. Yeah, OK. Um, well, anyways, then it goes on. The Midrash discusses the word et. Notice that's the direct object marker in the phrase. Kaniti uh, ish et. And then that it doesn't. It doesn't like to use, it doesn't like to spell out the divine name. So that little uh, thing after the et there is a, signifies Yahweh, right? 
So anyways, the Midrash discusses the word et in the phrase, Kaniti ish et yave. Uh, then it says, Rabbi Yishmael inquired the following of Rabbi Akiva. He said to him, given that you studied, so this is Rabbi Akiva, right? <laughs> He's asking Rabbi Akiva, Akiva a question. He said to him, given that you studied for 22 years under Nachum Ish Gamzu, who taught that all instances of the words ach and rak in scripture are diminutions, and all instances of the word etz and gam are amplifications, this word etz that is written here, what is it coming to include? <laughs> Our Akiva said to Rabbi Ishmael, had scripture stated, Kanishi Ish Hashem, without the word et, it would have posed a difficulty. But scripture states, Kanishi Ish et Hashem, which obviates the difficulty. Our Yishmael disagreed with Rabbi Akiva's exposition and said to him, Moses said, for it, the Torah, is not an empty thing for you. Uh, and if it is empty, that is only from you. That is because of you, for you did not know how to expound it properly. Rather, by saying et Hashem, that is direct object marker, the name, that they're putting Hashem there for the, the name Lord, et Yahweh. Eve was saying that in the past, Adam was created from the earth alone, and Eve herself was created from Adam alone. However, from now on, a person will be created in our image and in our likeness. A man will not produce a child without a woman, and so on. All right. The only thing I'm drawing attention to here initially is that you see here in the Midrash two rabbis, Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Ishmael, debating this sentence. Why is he called a man? And why does it say et Yahweh? Why does it have Yahweh preceded by the direct object marker, given that that is always functioning as a direct object marker? That's the big, that's the gist of this, this discussion here. Okay. Now here's the, the footnotes. Oops. If you look at, um, if you look at footnote 20 on the right side, it, it kind of is it's explaining to you what the rabbis are getting at. It says, it could be interpreted to mean, I have acquired God. Although the verse uses the word ish, man, scripture elsewhere, Exodus 15.3, refers to God as ish milchama, man of war, right? So it's saying, this is no problem. The, the word ish, man, is used for God elsewhere, Genesis or Exodus 15.3. And so because the verse can say, I have acquired God, they thought it was problematic that it uses the word ish as well. How could this be? But they say, well, that's no problem because Ish is used for God elsewhere. It goes on, alternatively, it could be interpreted to mean, I have acquired a human being who is God. Nezer HaChodesh. It's referring to another Jewish writing. Okay, now, um, uh, I won't go on with that. But notice that, <laughs> actually, if you go back to footnote 18, it says uh, the words, Ach and Rach, uh, generally translated respectively as but and only, are expounded as denoting some sort of exclusion or limitation. Then 19 says the word et generally serves to link a verb with its direct object and is thus not generally translated. However, it can also mean with, <laughs> and the word gam can mean also. These words are expounded as including something not mentioned in the text. So you can see here they're trying to wrestle with this. In fact, back here, notice that Rabbi Yakiva's uh, mentor taught him that it, it always had one meaning. It didn't mean direct object marker and something else. But in any case, uh, the fact is that the natural reading is, I have acquired a man, the Lord, or I have acquired a man who is the Lord. So it uses the verb kana the same verb used in Proverbs 8 to refer to God's eternal wisdom. And Eve interprets the one kanad, right? That's not a form of the Hebrew word, but the one acquired to be God, right? Now let me show you an intertextual link between Proverbs 8 and Psalm 2 and 2 and 10. Remember, we've already seen a bunch of birthing language used for wisdom in Proverbs 8. The, the word in Proverbs 8, 22 says, from everlasting, I was established. Okay. That word is only used in that form with that meaning established only one other time. 
Okay, again, this is intertextual gold. If you have two verses where a word is only used or only in common to those two verses, you very likely have an intertextual echo or reference of one to the other. Okay, the only other time that word is used is in Psalm 2 6, when it's used in that form with that meaning. Okay. As for me, I established my king upon Zion, my holy hill, my holy mountain. This is establishment language. It indicates uh, divine enthronement. And so, for example, all, elsewhere in Scripture, it speaks of God being enthroned at the time of the flood or God becoming king over Israel. This, this is a Proverbs is speaking of wisdom is being established over creation from the very beginning. And Psalm 2.6 likewise speaks of the establishment of the sun on Zion. Now, Psalm 110 indicates the, I mean, it's talking about the same thing, right? The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Where is this one sitting at the right hand of God? The heavenly Zion. It's obviously the same figure in view in Psalm 2.6. Well, if you've listened to my other programs, you know that I've demonstrated the intertextual relationship between Psalm 2 and Psalm 110, right? Psalm 2-7 and Psalm 110-3 both make reference to this one as begotten. Okay, Again, remember, Proverbs 8 and all the birthing language. Proverbs 8 refers to him as Chana, right? The one who is possessed or acquired, like Eve possessed or acquired Cain. Uh, Proverbs 8 uses the word cool to bring forth, which in the Septuagint is translated begotten, right? Well, Psalm 2-7 says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you're my son. Today I have begotten you. If you look at the consonantal text of Psalm 110-3, it also speaks of the begetting of this one, but it refers to this as a pre-temporal begetting. That is a begetting in eternity before the, the, the dawn of creation. Okay, uh, the Septuagint gets this right, but it, it's only the consonantal text of the Hebrew that, where you'll see this because the Masoretic vowel pointings try to obscure it. But if you look at the Hebrew text, the consonantal text, it's parallel to Psalm 2 7. They're obviously intertextually related. So, no mistake. That Kana is used as birthing language. The first occurrence is Genesis 4:1, when Eve believes she has given birth to the, the Savior promised by God, whom she thinks is God. No uh, coincidence that the establishment language is only shared in common between uh, Psalm 2 and Proverbs 8 and Psalm 110, where which also share one other word in common only in these two places, the establishment language. I might have repeated myself. <laughs> talking too long, perhaps. Um, but you've got all these intertextual echoes between Proverbs 8 and Genesis 1, and Proverbs 8 and uh, Genesis 4.1, Proverbs 8 and Psalm 2 and 110. Now let me show you an intertextual connection between Proverbs 8 and Micah 5.2. Or uh, This is Proverbs 8.22. It says, The Lord possessed me at the beginning of his way before his works of old, from everlasting, I was established. The, the word uh, before there is kadem. From everlasting, me'olam, I was established from the beginning, from the earliest times of the earth. So here you have both kadem and olam used for uh, uh, wisdom in Proverbs 8. The same two terms are used of the Messiah in Micah 5.2. As for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah from you. One will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. Remember that? Rule over you. His goings forth are from long ago. Mikdem. So it's the form of the word kadem. And uh, the word uh, olam. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. Okay. Now here's the translation of Robert Raymond which has interspersed in it some of his little comments. But it says, from you, that is, from Bethlehem as his place of birth, for me will go forth. Now, uses the word uh, yetzeh, form of yetzah, 
which means uh, to go forth. But the, the significance here is that this word is singular. Okay, This one is going to go forth from Bethlehem to be ruler in Israel. Then it says, whose, note the subject is the ruler in Israel, goings forth, right? Here, the word goings forth is plural. Whose goings forth have been from of old, even from the days of eternity. Okay, So here it speaks of one going forth, who has gone forth many times in the past from ancient times, even from the days of eternity. Okay, so there is a particular going forth in or from Bethlehem, but this going forth was preceded by innumerable goings forth from the days of eternity. Okay, and these words are the same words used in Proverbs 8 for wisdom. Now, here's Raymond's comments on this. He says, the plural form of the noun hardly allows the RSVs, the Revised Standard Version's origin, the NIV's origins, plural, though still a somewhat strange turn of phrase in the context, to say the least, does take cognizance of the plural form of the noun, whereas the adjacency of the noun to the same root in the preceding line, where it is meaning, where, where its meaning is unquestionably will go forth, powerfully argues for this same meaning for the noun in the third line. Okay, what he's saying is, it doesn't mean his origin, right? It means his goings forth in both occurrence, one is singular, one is plural. He's, he's going to go forth from Bethlehem. He has gone forth on numerous occasions in the past. Okay. He goes on to say it's not without significance that the Septuagint, the Greek translation, construed it this way, translating the form here for Yetzah, goings forth, by exodoi, goings out, the plural of exodus. Okay, so it's saying that he's going to go out from Bethlehem, but his goings out, his exoduses, are many in the past. Okay, then he goes on, as for the time phrases, it is true that from of old intends nothing more than from former times in isolated contexts, but can also mean eternity, as in Deuteronomy 32, 27, where God is described as the God of eternity. Looks like I forgot to include the Hebrew here. Uh, and while from days of old may refer to nothing more than to hoary antiquity, as in Micah 7.14, where the words refer to the Mosaic or patriarchal age, occurs in Proverbs 8.22 through 23 with, oh, so there's supposed to be a Hebrew word in here. I meant to go back and, and put the Hebrew words in. When I type in the, the English, I can't also put in the Hebrew. I have to go back and do something special. So there's certain gaps here that should be filled in with Hebrew words. What, it, what it's saying here in when it says occurs in Proverbs 8, 22 through 23 with, I forget which word it's used with, to denote the eternity preceding the beginning of the creation of the world. Occurring then as these time phrases do with the unusual noun meaning acts of going forth, it seems more plausible to think that it is this last sense that is intended. And again, for what it's worth, this is the way the Septuagint seems to have understood the phrases, for they are rendered in the Greek from the beginning out of the days of eternity. If we give the plural noun its full force, pointing as it does to prior repeated acts of going forth on the part of the ruler who was to be born in Bethlehem, we have every reason to include within the time frame allowed the phrases themselves, the idea even of eternity past, and to affirm that the third line refers to the goings forth of the Messiah in the person of the pre-existent Son or Logos in eternity past to create the world, also to his numerous subsequent goings forth as the angel of the Lord from patriarchal to Davidic times, and to his constant goings forth providentially to sustain and uphold all things by the word of his power. All right, so let's summarize what we've seen. Tobia Singer 
says that Genesis 1 has nothing in common or with John 1, except for that little phrase in the beginning, which he acts as like a kind of throwaway line. But in fact, the line is not a throwaway line. It would have evoked in the mind of any Jew the book of Genesis. In fact, the very book itself is named Barashit in the beginning. So when John begins that way, any Jew would have heard that thinking he's talking about the book of Genesis or its first line. And so when John goes on, moreover, to use other words that echo Genesis 1, it's clear that he has Genesis 1 in view and that he's very familiar with Genesis 1. He uses words like uh, became, just like it speaks of the light becoming or the light became. Uh, there are any number of words that are in common between these two texts. There's no question that John has Genesis 1 in view. We've seen that what John says about the word is nothing different than we could have read in any Targum. Right? In the beginning was the word, so say the Targums. Right? The word was with God, so say the Targums. The word was God, so say the Targums. Okay, the Targums don't say anything different than what John says up to those points. Moreover, the Targums are rooted and grounded in the Hebrew text itself. The Hebrew text is what gives rise to or provides the impetus for speaking about God in this way, speaking about this distinct divine person of the Godhead in this way. When Genesis 3 talks about the Kol Yahweh Elohim, the voice of the Lord walking in the garden, or the word of the Lord appearing and speaking to Abraham, you know, or repeatedly throughout the prophets where it says the word of the Lord came to Amos or came to Hosea, right? All these expressions indicate something about the word that goes beyond it being a bare utterance. It ascribes personhood to the word, and the Targumim understood this. The Targumim recognized this. And that's why, in good Midrashic fashion, they reflect this in their interpretive uh, paraphrases or translations of the Old Testament. Right? We've seen that the various Targums interpret Genesis 1 intertextually with Proverbs, understanding it not as a reference to Torah, but as a reference to the Memra of God, the Word of the Lord. Right? Later, Talmudic Rabbinic Judaism begins to transfer what was originally ascribed to God's memra to Torah in order to obviate the Christian understanding, displace the Christian understanding, exclude the Christian understanding, and then you know, pro, you know, put their own in its place. However, when we actually go to the text and do what the Midrashim were doing, that is engaging in intertextual exegesis, there's copious evidence, number one, that Proverbs 8 and Genesis 1 are intertextually related, but also that Proverbs 8 is related to other texts like Psalm 2, Psalm 110, both of which talk about the begetting of this one. Proverbs 8 speaks of the begetting of this one. Psalm 2 speaks of the begetting of the Son. Psalm 110 speaks of the begetting of the Son. Psalm 2 alone and Proverbs 8 alone in the Old Testament or together alone uh, use the word established. Uh, I mean, there's just so many intertextual connections also between Proverbs 8 and Micah 5.2, another Messianic text. Proverbs 8 and Genesis 4.1, which Eve express, where Eve expresses her Messianic expectation. So, at the end of the day, was Toby a singer being honest when he said to that woman, John the Apostle was off his rocker. John didn't say anything that you could find in the Old Testament or in Jewish sources. John was just making it all up. You know, Tobia Singer is trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. Uh, to Tobia Singer is, uh, I mean, my goodness. He's either incredibly ill-informed with his own sources, or he's incredibly willing to obfuscate and be an obscurantist and hide certain damaging facts from people that will listen to him. Now, I don't want to say too much because I, I don't want to, you know, I don't need to get too uppity about it, but Toby a singer should be ashamed of himself. Uh, and I'll just, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> uh, 
all right. Any questions, people, on any of that? Have I lost all of you? Have I absolutely lost you all? <laughs> Have I lost you all? I'm going to, first of all, look at the Super Chats real quick here. Um, just so I don't miss those. Man. Okay, so Al Crego says, for a large bag of begging strips. <laughs> for the new dog, huh? All right. Even the dog gets in on this. Lars Seth says, is modern Jews still hold the same view as ancient Jews held about the Messiah in reference to the text, characteristic, and et cetera, concerning Messiah? So Jews are not a monolith. Uh, there's all kinds of differences between Jews. But I, I would say standard Judaism, if it's, if it's not some bizarre thing, bizarre sect of Judaism, will have some sort of messianic expectation. Some very watered down forms of Judaism just think more in terms of like a messianic time minus a Messiah, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But Orthodox Jews, um, traditional Jews, so forth, still believe in a coming Messiah. They don't expect him to do what he did in his first coming. So they don't expect a Messiah who's going to come and defeat Satan by striking a mortal blow to his head while at the same time sustaining a painful wound in his own heel, like Genesis 3.15 says, right? Or a Messiah who will suffer and then rise again, like Psalm 16 says, or Isaiah 52 through 53 says. But they do have expectation of a coming Davidic king. Uh, he's going to reestablish Israel in their homeland. I mean, there's all these things they have associated with it, minus the gospel, right? So uh, there is that expectation there. Uh, but they do depart from ancient Jews in quite a number of ways. You'll find Jews today being quite comfortable watering down the messianic import of a certain text, uh, even though earlier Jews were adamant that it was a messianic text, right? So you'll you'll find dis disparities between ancient Jews and contemporary Jews, but there is still the standard expectation of a Messiah in the sense of like a, a militaristic deliverer and that kind of thing. Um, Al Crego, oh, you already, I already got you. I already got you. <laughs> um, Breakfast Gun says, how do we read Proverbs 8.22 with an Aryan leaning? And what does the original text literally say? RSV and NIV could be used to imply Arianism, while others like KJV and ESV can't. Okay, so that's what I was getting at when I talked about Kana. Kana, the only certain meaning that we have, when we look at certain texts, it has to mean acquired, right? In the in the preponderance of text, or possessed, right? It's referring to a possession, often to a possession that was acquired, right? But in any case, a possession. How, however, you came to it, whether you acquired it or you just possess it. That I mean, that expression is used throughout Proverbs, right? We're told to uh, kana wisdom, right? We're told to get wisdom, possess it, acquire it. The Arians wanted to say the word means create. And that's because in the Greek version, it does use the word for create, which is a mistake. Okay, When you look at the Hebrew text, it always uses it in the sense of possession or acquire when we can tell what the meaning is for certain. As I said earlier, there are some occasions where it could mean create. But I'll give you an example. Genesis 14 uh, in Genesis 14, it, it refers to God as God most high possessor of heaven and earth. Some people would say there, it that's the word Kana. Some people would say there, it could mean creator. God's the creator of heaven and earth. Yeah. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He's also the ruler of heaven and earth. He is the sustainer of heaven and earth he is the you know uh benefit i mean you could plug in any word you want there and it's going to make sense what people do is they say hey look it could mean create in this context and therefore the word kana can mean create no 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 no. that's not how it works that's not how you do it 
you have to show a text where it has to mean that and establish that the word has this meaning before you can then say in these other texts where it could go either way, or well, then it, you know, it might have this meaning. It just, that's just proper, uh, you know, linguistic analysis. That's, you know, nobody proceeds the other way around, not, not legitimately. So, but when you look at the context of Genesis 14, remember what's happening there. Abraham has just come back victorious from the battle. Uh, he doesn't accept anything from the kings, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah. He gives it all to them. He ties to Melchizedek. And in the blessing, God is referred to as the possessor of heaven and earth. Abraham is eschewing anything from the, the Sodomites lest they say he make, they made him rich and so forth. He's uh, giving it all to them and trusting in God and giving a tenth to God and, and acknowledging God as the owner of everything, the possessor of everything. That's the best meaning in the context, and that's the only certain meaning of the word elsewhere, right, is to possess or acquire. Uh, so, And then when you look at the other language that's used in Proverbs 8, wisdom exists before all of creation, right? In Proverbs 8, it speaks of wisdom existing uh, before the mountains, before the hills, before the, the God drew a circle on the deep, you know, before everything. Wisdom was there. In fact, wisdom was God's craftsman in the creation of the world. So there's there's no reason to take Kana there in a temporal sense. We would understand this by virtue of the analogy of faith. To, under, to, to mean the same sort of thing that we see spoken of the word elsewhere in Scripture as the eternally begotten of the Father, right? Uh, it, it's The New Testament is only too clear on the eternality of the word. So is the Old Testament, by the way. way. But uh, John 1, 1, when it says, in the beginning was the word, the imperfect tense, contrasted with egeneta or forms of the word genomai, the word was, the world became, Right, showing that everything else came into existence, but the word already and always was. Right, Jesus in John 17, 5 says, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with you before the world became. So there's this clear contrast between the word as the one subsisting already and everything else as becoming and everything becoming through him. In fact, John's language is, is quite emphatic. John says, all things became through him, panta, all, all things came through him, and without him, not one thing came into being that has come into being. So if not one thing has come into being without him, then he himself did not come into being, because everything that came into being came into being through him, right? So John's gospel is quite clear in its opening verse. In fact, I would argue, if we had more time, that the second clause of John 1, 1 and the second verse are both driving at the same point, right? It says, in the beginning was the word. The second clause says, the word was with God. Verse 2 says, the same was in the beginning with God. What it's doing is it's equating, just like we think of God existing in the beginning, that is, he is the, the Alpha and the Omega, the origin of all things, we are to also think in the same way of the word, always father, always son, right? That's the, the phrase of Alexander of Alexandria. You also have other statements like Colossians 1.17. After speaking of Christ as the firstborn over all creation, it says he is before all things and in him all things hold together. Note, it doesn't just say he was before all things, which would be sufficient to establish his eternality. It says he is before all things. Right now, he is. He is before all things. This is another way of approaching the Greek rendering of Exodus 3.14. Ego emi haon. I am the being, the existing one. Paul in Colossians 1 is saying in another way, the Son is. He has being. He exists independently of the temporal order. He is, he exists apart from creation. That is outside of time, space, and so forth. Uh, Hebrews 1 speaks of the Son as the one who created the ages, right? 
It says, uh, through the sun, God created the ages. Uh, numerous other texts I could go over. But you have the same idea in uh, in the Old Testament. I looked at Micah 5.2, where it says his goings forth are from of old, from the days of eternity. Uh, looked at, or didn't look at, but could have quoted Isaiah 9.6, where he's called Aviad, the father of everlastingness, the father of eternity, meaning he's the origin and source of everything. He possesses eternity. Um, we could, I could go on and on with that. But the, the basic fact here, though, is Kana does not mean create. Kana is another word related to begetting uh, or possessing in, in some sort of uh, father or filial paternal sense. Right? It's indicating a filial paternal relationship in some way, just like cool, just like Yalad, just like these other birthing terms. The son's begetting, although it uses language that we're familiar with in human experience, precisely because it relates to God, right, has to be stripped of all carnal ideas or, or finite categories, right? We don't think of God literally procreating the son, begetting him physically. And, and in the same way, God's not a temporal being, so the begetting is not temporal, God is indivisible, so this doesn't involve any division or partition in God. The Son possesses the same essence. This is all the, the theology, like, so when we, in other words, sometimes people are trying to understand these words in ways that are divorced from the theology that, that is stated didactically, right? Didactically, we're told that the Son is eternal. We're told that the Son is God by nature, by essence, we're told that the Son is everything that the Father is. And so when we understand the begetting of the Son, the, the generation of the Son, we are to think of it in ways befitting God, right? Ways that uh, are consistent with God's mode of existence, right? Um, all right. Oh, wait. Let me go through the rest of these uh, super chat. Thank you so much, Corinth Chandler. And thank you, the daily gripe. You said by its use of Psalm 104, Hebrews 1 7 seems place creative action performed by God to Jesus as he who established the earth upon its foundations and is the one whom wisdom is said to be with. Connection with Neophyte. Um, let me think here. I'm. Let me just pull up Hebrews 1 because you said verse 7, but I'm thinking you might mean something else. Hold on. Oh, okay. Well, so the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds, his ministers flames of fire. I, I, I'm confused here because Hebrews 1 7 is referring to Psalm 104, but the statement. Oh, wait, let me look at. Okay, let me look at Psalm 104. I may be. It looks to me like your statement had more to do with what the author says later, referring to a different psalm. Oh, I see. I see what you're talking about now. I see. O Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. Um, so I suspect, looking here, if I were to look at the Hebrew, where it says, in wisdom, let me look at the Hebrew real quick. I'm just suspecting it might, it might legitimately be rendered with wisdom. So, and I'll, I'll bet the Targums would take it that way, but I would have to look that up. Um, hold on, just pulling up the Hebrew here real quick. Psalm 104, 24 says, How manifold are your works, Yahweh, them all? With wisdom. <laughs> yeah, so that's interesting because in... Um, 
in one of the Targums, and I think you're saying Neophyte, but I don't know if that's... Oh, well, let me see real quick. One of the Targums does actually say Behachma, <laughs> in wisdom or with wisdom. But I'm trying to see real quick. From the beginning with wisdom. A. Yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty good potential insight. I'll have to think more about that, but it looks good. It looks good. By its use of Psalm 104, Hebrews 1 7 seems place creative action performed by God to Jesus as he who established the earth upon its foundation as the one whom wisdom is said to be with, connection with Neophyte. So definitely the wisdom language is uh, is the same. Behukma. So interesting, interesting, interesting. Thank you so much, Daily Gripe. All right, all right. Moving down here. Thank you so much, Debbie David. Thank you so much for the super chat. All right, I think I'm getting closer to the end. So if my mods could tell me if I missed any super chats. Wait, here's one from Pierce Taylor. Thank you so much, Pierce. Thank you, thank you to all of you for your super chats. Um, all right. Thank you so much, Raymond. Did someone say Raymond? <laughs> oh, I said Robert Raymond earlier. <laughs> Robert Raymond is a, actually a very stalwart theologian. I love his stuff, uh, but he has a book on, he has two books that are very useful on Christology. One is Jesus, Divine Messiah, the Old Testament Witness, and then another one is the New Testament Witness. Both of them are very good. Um, but yeah, I said Robert Raymond, but I'm happy to say Raymond, uh, this Raymond, you, <laughs> thank you so much, Raymond. Um, and thank you, Frank. Frank says, would it be accurate to see ego and me as Jesus saying, I am the, I am due to its seemingly redundant nature. Um, so I'm assuming that what you mean is redundant is the ego, uh, because in Greek, you don't need to use the pronoun. E ego means I. Emi means I am. You could just say emi to mean I am. But ego emi makes it emphatic, right? I, I am, or I myself am, or something like that. In the Old Testament, this expression is found seven times on the lips of God. Once in Deuteronomy 32, 39, and then six other times in Isaiah. Uh, in the New Testament, Jesus uses it seven times in the Gospel of John. Um, in in that's that's the Greek rendering, but in the in the Hebrew, it's Annie who, which also means. So it literally Annie who means I he or I am he, right? Annie means I who means he. So Annie who means is translated in Greek as ego and me. Okay, so that's where you get that expression. It's not from Exodus 3, by the way. Uh, this expression is, is without a predicate. So it, it just says, I am, without anything added. There, it's not like, I am tall, I am wise, I am me. You know, it's, it's, it's I am without a predicate. And so it's understood as an absolute I am statement. That kind of expression is used seven times in the old, seven times in the Gospel of John. You also have I am statements in the other Gospels, but um, I would just say it's it's just an emphatic way of saying I am. You know, so it's uh, it's obviously an echo of those Old Testament usages, and just grammatically, it is emphatic because you don't need the additional I. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it, in terms of, 
its implications, it's directly out of the mouth of God. Jesus is speaking the same way God speaks, identifying himself as the I am. All right. So Raymond says, thank you for your kind consideration. <laughs> oh, Raymond is too kind. He's over here kindly giving me a super chat, calling me kind. <laughs> um, let's see. Synagogue says, James White says the expression is a short of Exodus 314 found in Isaiah first. I don't know if that's right, but I've heard such. I'm not sure what, what, what you mean there. Um, I mean, I've read uh, Dr. White's treatment of some of this, and he actually makes, I do know he makes connection with the Isaiah references and stuff like that. Um, I wouldn't say that Exodus 3.14 is altogether irrelevant to it, but it has a predicate, so it's not exactly grammatically the same. It's uh, in, in, in the Greek version of Exodus 3.14, the divine name is ha on, not ego emi, right? Ego emi ha on. Ego, there it has a predicate. So it's saying, I am the being. Now, by the way, that expression too is used for Jesus in the New Testament. When it says ha on, the being, that expression is used for Jesus. You have, for example, John 1 18, where it says, No man has seen God at any time, but. God, the only begotten, the being, ha'on, in the bosom of the Father, he has revealed him. Right. So you have that expression. It's used in other places, too. So that expression is used for Jesus as well. So you certainly have this uh, in the background of New Testament theology and so forth. Um, yeah. All right. Any other comments? Did I go as long as I thought I would? Wait, I started at eight. So this was a three and a half hour show. Okay, now I can't read that. Is that Ethiopian? Is that Ethiopian? Tell me, tell me, is that Ethiopian? I can't read it, but it's kind of like, I kind of feel, or I feel like, uh, you know how you can hear another language that you don't know, but you know if it's, you know, French or Spanish. <laughs> okay. Thalema says, uh, or Thalema says it's Ingridic. It's Ingridic. Okay. So wait, what was the question? I lost the question. Here we go. Okay. Anthony, do you think that Jesus took flesh from his mother or not? Yes. <laughs> he was conceived of Mary. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's a follow-up to that, but yes. Jesus was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, but took our nature from his mother. So Samuel says it is sort of, it's called, Ge'ez. so it's sort of Ethiopic or Ethiopian or whatever. Oh, so Slam says he's gone. So I'm talking to myself <laughs> or I'm talking to you, but um, is it accurate at all to say Jesus is the Torah, Tanakh, Bible made flesh? Well, if, if you want to say, well, let me say this. Notice that Jesus, Jesus in John 5 said to the Jews, you search the scriptures thinking that in them you have eternal life, but these scriptures testify about me. So already in the time of Jesus, the Jews were beginning to see the Torah as the as an end in itself, rather than as that which points to the end, right? Paul says in Romans 10, Christ is the end of the law for all who believe. And there, I think what Paul is getting at is that Christ is the end, that he is, he is the goal, 
towards which the law was pointing, much like in Galatians when he says the law was our schoolmaster or tutor to lead us to Christ. And so I would say that Jesus is the Torah in the sense that the Torah is all about him. To properly understand it is to understand what it says about him and is to be led to him. And he perfectly embodies then the everything that the Torah promised, everything that God was planning, everything that God was working out in history. And so in, in that kind of sense, you know, I would say Jesus is the Torah. But, you know, obviously, I don't mean that in a, in a flat-footed, you know, sense. You know, I, I don't think that the Torah, a written book, literally became flesh. I believe that a person, the second person of the Trinity, became flesh. Uh, and I'm sure that's you're not suggesting otherwise. <laughs> I'm just, just, uh, yeah. Just, okay. Oh, he's back. Slam says he's back. You missed. You missed my answer. My answer to your question was yes. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. So is lizard? Is lizard saying? Uh, he had a super chat. Lizard stuck around. I'm proud of him. I didn't know if he would be able to <laughs> stick around with uh, before my mods would decide that he'd cross the line. Um, Bine says, someone was curious about textual criticism of who is in heaven in John 3.13. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously the critical text doesn't include it. Uh, majority text does. So it would come down to if you're a majority text person, you're going to grant it already, right? Because it's part of the majority text. Um, but those who, in you know, take a different approach to textual criticism, grant greater credence to certain manuscripts and so forth, uh, they're going to say it's it's not original. Um For the, the the issue part of the problem though is John three thirteen, like if you read John three, it's not easy to tell where one person is speaking and leaves off, and another person is speaking, and so even if John three thirteen is part of it, it's not clear if Jesus is the one who said it or if it's John who said it. In which case, because if it's Jesus who's saying it, God so loved the world that he gave his only God, you know, but he's saying, you know, even this, you know, nobody has ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven, even the son of man who is in heaven. It means one thing if Jesus is the one saying it to those that he's talking to, right, Nicodemus or whatever, or if John, the apostle saying it later, meaning John is saying nobody's ascended into heaven, but he who came down from heaven even the son of man who is in heaven, right? Because when John was writing it, the son of man would be in heaven. So you still have a, an issue to wrestle with there, even if you think that that's original, because it's not clear if it's words that are being attributed to Jesus that he spoke during his earthly ministry, or are they words that John as the narrator is writing after Christ's ascension when Jesus was in heaven. Now, certainly... I hold that Christ is omnipresent, even though he became flesh. And it doesn't hang or stand or fall on that verse. Jesus is God, possesses all the essential attributes of deity, and so of necessity is omnipresent. That's why he can be called, even at his birth, Emmanuel, God with us. And then in Matthew 18, at the center of the gospel, say where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. And then say again at the end of the gospel, when he sends the disciples out into all the world, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age, right? Uh, so you have these three references in Matthew's gospel to the son's presence everywhere with his people and numerous others besides, you know, I mean, there's numerous references to Christ dwelling in us by faith, uh, references to Christ filling all in all, um, that sort of thing, Ephesians 4. All right. Um, let's see. 
Why is Jesus' genealogy in Matthew shorter than Luke? Also, how is conquest of David just five generations? Um, well, in the first place, the, the genealogies, there's, there's much discussion there, any numerous or any number of ways that, uh, and, and I'd have to work, go through a whole thing explaining these things and then try and nail down for you the one that I think best explains things. But, uh, one standard way that people talk about the genealogies is to say one is giving us the genealogy of Joseph. The other is giving us the genealogy of Mary. And there are other things that are brought into the explanation having to do with Leverett marriage and how people are reckoned as a son in light of, say, adoption or the death of somebody. So one standard view is simply to say that we're giving we're getting two different genealogies, one for Joseph, one for Mary. And there are other ways that people explain that. But I would say this, in addition, besides sorting out that question, is Matthew is deliberately engaging in, uh, he's being stylistic. It, it wasn't necessary in genealogies to include every single person in, in uh, succession. You could skip people, right? Uh, you would say somebody's the son of somebody, even if they were the grandson of that person, right? So you could say, um, Jesus is the son of David, right? Not directly, but through all these generations, right? So when you look at the genealogy in Matthew, you're hearing so-and-so is the son of so-and-so is the son of so-and-so. You're not necessarily being given the immediate link in the chain, but sometimes two, three, or more down. And what Matthew is trying to do is he's, he's putting special emphasis on Jesus as the Messiah, the king, and so he's putting emphasis on his Davidic descent. So he mentions David twice in the genealogy in order to come up with lists of 14, right? If you don't pay attention, you don't know what he did. He counts David twice on purpose, but he also, you know, only includes in each section 14 because numerically the number of David's name is 14, right? So you have, it, it, it's basically a stylized gene, genealogy. So there's no, no issue there with it being short. He just didn't include everybody in order to make a point. Um, all right. What else here? Conrad says. Oh, I just answered that. Didn't I? Oh, I see. Several people are just are reminding or telling me that I missed the question or something. All right. So I don't see any super chat so let me see what my old friend the lizard king has on his tiny mind <laughs> i'm just kidding lizard king <laughs> for those that don't know lizard king used to come more often in the past can't really tell where he's coming from he more often just uh seems like a, I don't know atheist agnostic um oh here we go so the Lizard King apparently is going to tell us a comforting story. It's com it's very comforting to the Lizard King to think that all religions are made up. So let's let's see what he has to say. Ancient civilizations mostly created their religions and beliefs to comfort and explain the unexplainable. <laughs> I'm sorry, Lizard King. Did I cut you off at the pass? It's not hard to believe Christianity has these qualities. <laughs> okay, first of all, Lizard King, I have a father. Well, my, my father died. My mother's still alive, but it was very comforting to me growing up that I had a father. The fact that it was comforting to me doesn't mean that I made it up. Okay. So just because some people make things up to comfort them doesn't mean that something that comforts you is necessarily made up. It, it could be real. Okay. So when you go to the store and you see comfort food, don't automatically think this is an illusion. This is an illusion because people make things up to comfort themselves. It's probably real. And if you try to walk out the store with it without paying for it, because you think it's an illusion, because you think anything that comforts you is made up, then you're going to get arrested. Okay. And you're going to go to a cell. And if you tell them that it's an illusion, you're going to go to one with rubber walls. Okay. <laughs> you know, it's all in good fun, Lizard King. 
I got to grab your tail every once in a while and watch it fall off and wiggle. Um, uh, Walter says, can you explain why English translation used feminine pronouns to refer to wisdom? Is wisdom a reference to the sun or an attribute of the sun? Okay, so in Hebrew and Greek, words have grammatical gender that don't have any necessary bearing on the natural gender of what's being talked about. And so because the Hebrew word Sophia is feminine, it uses feminine pronouns uh, to comport grammatically with that. Uh, so I'll give you an example. I mean, if you, the, the Hebrew word for father is av. The plural for father or for fathers is avot. That's a feminine ending. Okay, so grammatically it's feminine, but nobody would think that fathers are feminine, right? It just, it, it has a grammatical function. And so it's irrelevant to the, the, the natural gender or what have you of, of wisdom. So I wouldn't say that uh, it, it's a way of, uh, now it, it is true that if we're talking about wisdom as an attribute, that's an attribute of the sun. But I take it that wisdom there is being used as a title for a person, just like word is being used as a title for the sun and other titles. The branch is used as a title for the sun and so forth. Um, I had a quote here from Karen Jobes, who's actually a very good Greek scholar, Septuagint scholar. And she makes a comment uh, just totally thrashing feminists who try to misuse this. Uh, this so this is a a woman who's a a giant of uh, scholarship, who's who's doing this. So it's kind of funny. But uh, she had this great comment about that. But I it would take me too long to find it. But uh, yeah, it just has to do with grammatical, not natural gender. And it's kind of like you know you've got plugs in your house, you know, and they say, uh, or you you have various parts to things, and they'll say, you know, grab the female or grab the male it's, it doesn't mean that these things are actually male or female. It's just a way of saying how they fit together. Right. So, uh, so somebody says I'm a liar. <laughs> Anthony, you're a liar. Explain Jose 11, nine and John 17, three. <laughs> now, first of all, first of all, I didn't even mention either one of those texts. So you're going to have to, you're going to have to pony up here and tell me what I lied about. <laughs> Refute one thing I've said before I proceed to answer. I mean, you know, you want me to explain. It's like asking me to, you know, asking me to reconcile uh, the father and the son. Why would I need to reconcile the father and the son? There, There's never been any rift between them, right? You don't reconcile friends. So first explain to me your scurrilous charge that I'm a liar, and then I'll be happy to explain Hosea 11, 9 and John 17, 3 after you also tell me why you think those are problematic texts that need explanation. I don't see any problem with those texts. But why, why, oh, why, no fear am I a liar? Have no fear. Tell me why I'm a liar. Have no fear. Tell me why I'm a liar. So actually, it reminds me, um, where's no fear? Did he come back? <laughs> so I was actually going to start with um, a, I, I, Carlos Xavier, the son-in-law of Anthony Buzzard, pops in from time to time on one of my videos and he'll leave a comment. And it never ceases to amaze me how slow some Unitarians can be. Carlos said, I think it was on one of my videos, the son, uh, Jesus is the Son of God, that I did with Al Fadi. Carlos said, Jesus died, God can't die, Jesus is not God, right? Now, now here's why this amazes me. Number one, I have answered Carlos, right? I have answered him in text on that. I answered him in public debate on that. 
So that's number one. Why do people repeat things they know have been refuted? What they're hoping is the person that hears it next won't know the answer to it. Okay. I, I remember there was this Jehovah's Witness that I met once in a bookstore, and I caught him in the bookstore trying to mislead this young girl, and I refuted him, and we parted ways eventually, and then I, I came across him again in the bookstore, because I used to work there. I came across him again, and I overheard him using the same argument. And I went up to him and I said, sir, I said, you're using the same argument I addressed last time, which you conceded was a bad argument. Why are you using it again? Isn't that dishonest? And the guy just kind of hung his head in shame. People will do this. People will repeat bad arguments. OK, Carlos Xavier is an example of that. I've refuted him on his argument before, but he still uses it. But now here's this, the other thing. This this just astounds me. It doesn't take me to refute an argument as bad as that, okay? Carlos says, God can't die, Jesus died, therefore Jesus isn't God, okay? You'll see why I'm bringing this up in a second. It says, if Carlos doesn't know that the Bible says and that Christians believe that the Word became flesh, okay? So we might just as well say, God can't sleep, Jesus slept, therefore Jesus can't be God. But of course, the answer is, God, the word became flesh, and by virtue of that was able to sleep, right? By virtue of that ate, by virtue of that walked, by virtue of that, you know, blinked his eyes, by virtue of that bled and died, okay? This isn't rocket science, okay? It's, it's not that hard. Christians believe in an incarnation. God became flesh. So quit repeating lame arguments, Carlos Xavier. It's also the lame argument very much related to the one that No Fear was raising. No Fear says, explain Hosea 11.9. You're a liar. Isaiah 11.9 says, I will not execute my first fierce anger. I will not destroy Ephraim again. For I am God and not a man, the Holy One in your midst, and I will not come in wrath. So here in Hosea 11.9, God says to the nation of Israel through Hosea the prophet, I am God and not a man. Okay. This sounds like Tobia Singer. Oh, look, there is no incarnation because it's not mentioned in Genesis. No Christian believes Jesus became incarnate at the creation of the world. He became incarnate in the first century. By the same token, my Unitarian friends, when Hosea 11.9 says, God says, I am God and not a man, the incarnation had not occurred. The statement is absolutely true. Besides that, the whole point of the statement isn't even about uh, I mean, the point of the statement is to say that God's promises are sure he doesn't change uh, and so forth. So he's, he's making this promise uh, that he uh, is not going to come in wrath and they can bank on it, right? Because he's not a liar like men. Well, Jesus wasn't a liar like men either, right? So the, the main thrust of the passage is just to say God's not a liar like men. But even if we just want to focus on the fact that God's saying I'm God and not a man. Nobody says that God was a man prior to the incarnation. Okay. So I don't know. Unitarians, you need to step up your game. Okay. And so I, I was very gracious. No fear. I answered your question, even though you called me a liar without telling me why I'm a liar. And even though you didn't tell me why Hosea 11, nine needs to be addressed, since it doesn't pose any problem to my theology, I still addressed it. So if you want to come back, I'll be happy to address John 17, 3. But until then, you look like a man who slandered me, called me a liar when I'm not. And you look like you presented a text that doesn't prove what you wanted it to prove. Don't have any fear in showing your face again. I mean, I'm still a nice guy. Titus 3, 5 just proves the RC concept of works of justice, a.k.a. progressive justification, or is that out of the focus of the passage? No, I think Titus 3.5 is, is perfect. There's a good article I read the other day on that, actually, where a guy, I can't even remember the website, the guy actually has some good discussion of patristic interpretation of Ephesians 2.8 and the nature of faith, and faith is a gift of God and that sort of thing. Uh, but he also has a good article on Titus 3.5, and that is, uh, he, he's 
he's mainly looking at the issue of regeneration and justification in that text. But yeah, it, the text says that we're uh, not served or not saved by. Uh, I'm trying to think of the exact phrase. Um, why am I drawing a blank? Not by works. Not not by works that we have done in righteousness. I think. Let me see. Titus three five. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. Right. So, yeah, the Roman Catholic view is that there are certain preparatory things that must be done unto justification. These works are necessary. They wouldn't necessarily call them meritorious in one sense, though it might be appropriate in another sense. But then subsequent to those preparatory works, one then receives the infusion of righteousness and is then enabled to go on to do works that are fully meritorious and merit eternal life and so forth. Paul just lays the ax to that. God saved us, right? Not by... De not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. So it's interesting there because Paul Paul doesn't, Rome will sometimes want to say that it's not deeds done prior to faith. It's by deeds done after faith. So that these are deeds done in righteousness that save us. And so when Paul excludes works, they want to say, oh, it's works done prior to faith. In other words, not deeds done in righteousness. But Paul in Titus 3, 5 excludes deeds done in righteousness. These are works done in faith, right? God saved us apart from even that, right? He, it wasn't because of deeds done in righteousness by us, but by his mercy that he saved us. So, yeah, thank you for that, Ryan. Hey, I'm actually wondering, is this Ryan the one that... Uh, Ryan, did you message me the other day about an article you wrote? I'm trying to think if the, if the person's name was Ryan. I'm sorry. I've been very busy. I I was sent something that I want to post for everybody. Oh, it is him. Okay. I'm usually terrible with names. So I'm really surprised that uh, I remembered this. So I'm going to post on my community page. for the. Uh, some of you know that a while back I did a video on faith or faithfulness where I'm showing that faith doesn't mean faithfulness. Now, it doesn't mean that having faith is, you know, it doesn't mean that we, we are not faithful. Or it doesn't even mean that you can't use faith in some sort of figurative sense as a way of referring to faithfulness. But faith itself doesn't mean faithfulness. And certainly in, in soteric context, context talking about salvation, it's not talking about our faithfulness. It's talking about believing trusting in christ in the gospel and so forth so i did that and originally i was just going to do a thing on faith not being faithfulness but at that time uh, uh slim shamoon calling him slim because he calls me fat boy so <laughs> we'll call we'll call him slim slim shamoon <laughs> don't do this at home people only i can do this Okay. As much as Sam will call me nasty names, at the end of the day, you all have to know in his heart of hearts, that man can't stop loving me. Okay. <laughs> he became a heretic. He departed from the gospel. He believes he needs to lash out at me now. But down, deep down in, uh, uh, <laughs> underneath all that curmudgeon, curmudgeonly uh, ness, if that's a, if I can coin a word. <laughs> Curmudgeon's a word. I don't know about curmudgeonliness. Anyways, underneath it all, uh, there's there's still, you know, I still sense good in him. I can turn him back from the dark side. One of these, <laughs> I don't know. Maybe maybe I will. Maybe I won't. I don't know. But nobody else on that side of the fence over there truly cares about that man's soul. They're they're willing to just let him go on and and act act like a. 
I don't know. Anyways, so um, so I, I was originally just gonna do, <laughs> I was just gonna do this thing on faith or faithfulness, but Sam decided at that time to like put out this big thing like, oh, I'm gonna if Anthony Rogers doesn't repent by high noon, you know, he didn't use high noon. That's that's how I <laughs> just sounded to me like some old west some old western showdown or something. If Anthony Rogers doesn't repent soon. I'm going to come down on him, you know, and so on and so forth. So I thought, okay, I was originally just going to do this on faith or faithfulness, but now I'm going to bring up Sam because Sam is the one who is trying to give us the newfangled definition of faith, meaning faithfulness. So anyways, it's been a while since I did that. Finally, apparently, Sam thought that he was going to respond to it. I haven't listened to it yet, but somebody contacted me and said, Hey, I think it was Sahi Luke. Sahi Luke contacted me and said, Hey, uh, Sam was trying to revamp his newfangled, uh, position that faith means faithfulness. Uh, and it's going really bad. Right. And then he said, and then somebody called in and was making some really good points and then suddenly Sam like got rid of him or something. Now I haven't heard it. So I'm just recounting what I heard and maybe not even recounting that as perfectly accurately. Um, so just take that part for what it's worth. There might be some inequitable uh, statements there, but I do know that Sam was doing a show on faith, meaning faithfulness and that somebody called in. And so later Ryan uh, contacted me and mentioned that he had written an article and I didn't get it. I wanted to read the whole thing. I read a good portion of it. I think I read half of it. It was, it was late for me, I think. And uh, I, I intended to read the whole thing, but I'm going to post it on my community page uh, pretty soon. Uh, but everything I read looked great. So I'm, I'm excited about, uh, about sharing that with you guys. Uh, Especially since, you know, I mean, I don't have all the time in the world. You know, my buddy Slim doesn't have a job. He hasn't had a regular job for 20 years. So he's got all the time in the world to go on YouTube. I, the time I do come on here, I've spent a lot of time preparing some of this stuff for you to show you the slides and, and all these things. So uh, my appearances on here are fewer and farther between. Um, you know, so I, I and I, that's part of the reason why I just say, hey, guys, why don't you debate me? You know, instead of doing all this stuff, why not? Why not just debate? Right. Uh, Sam didn't want to debate. He wanted William to do it. William's been tucking tail for eight months. Uh, then he got uh, Kai on there. I challenged Kai. Kai doesn't want to debate. He got Perry Robinson on there. Perry Robinson's all the rage. I still haven't listened to a thing Perry Robinson has said, except maybe five minutes at the beginning of some of these things just to get an idea of his temperament and that sort of thing. Uh, and I know he's, he's put out by that. He's insulted. He doesn't realize that Sam was using him as a pawn. And so he thinks that somehow, you know, I'm supposed to be giving him all the attention in the world right now. But I realize that Sam is using these guys. So that's why I challenged him, but he didn't want to do it. So then I accepted with William. He's nowhere in sight. Uh, Kai doesn't want to do it. Perry Robinson doesn't want to do it. Perry Robinson has been tweeting mess. I'm not even on Twitter. He's over there tweeting. Will Anthony Rogers accept the debate with Cobain with, uh, uh, you know, nothing against Cobain. And, and I'm, I'm happy to debate him. I was already contacted by other people to debate Cobain. So I'm looking forward to that. But I, I said from day one, first William Albrecht. Okay. They were the original guys. It was the brothers in arms. Slim Shamoon and William Albark Albrecht, who were, you know, coming down like a ton of bricks, you know, using all the nasty things that came into their heads so easily, right? Saying they were going to muzzle me, calling me a demon and, you know, uh, all the rest. So uh, just keeping my eye on the ball, you know. Uh, but anyways, uh, <laughs> happy to debate Cobain. So anyways, uh, I don't know how I got off on all that, but I. I will say this since I did get off onto it. It's funny. William's William's still up to tricks. <laughs> so he, 
after Marlon keeps texting him, hey, when are we going to do this? 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 Um, eventually, William responds by saying, um, just to let you guys know. <clears throat> oh, wait, no, no. That's that's Marlon. Let me go back. Hold on. Um, so William eventually replied, I'm ready now. Here, let me just show it to you um, without the glare. I'm ready now. Let's work on a date. Just finished my last one, and I've, I'm reading this backwards, and I've moved my next one a few months. Let's work on a date that works for all of us, okay? So Marlon says, let's do it. Now, it sounds like William's already, doesn't it? <laughs> he, moved, he moved heaven and earth to clear his schedule, his ever busy schedule, okay? I moved everything around so we can get this going, right? All sounds good. Then Marlon says, let's do it Monday, the 27th of June. And then I said, that works for me, right? Can you see it? Hold on. It says, that works for me. Then what does William say? That doesn't work for me. Full schedule next week as I prepare to fly out to Germany, okay? Does the day matter uh, as in during the, uh, the week or the weekend? So I'm going to show you the rest in just a second. But I want you to hear what William's saying, right? Cleared my whole schedule, ready to debate. Let's get this going. Okay, how about this date? No, it doesn't work for me. Uh, then, uh, you know, why doesn't it work? Well, because he's preparing to go to Germany, okay? So, in other words, <laughs> it's like um, I can't do it uh, today. Well, how do you put this? It's like I'm going to be in Germany in a week. So I can't do it now before I go to Germany because I'm preparing to go to Germany, right? And so when he's in Germany, he's not going to be able to do it because he's going to be busy in Germany, right? So next thing, he's probably going to say, I can't do it. <laughs> it's like, in other words, <laughs> it just sounds to me like I can't do it because on this day I've got this and I'm preparing to do this. And I'm preparing to prepare to do this. And I'm preparing to prepare to do that. Right. So in other words, he's got to bury his father. Uh, he's got to, I'm being facetious, right? Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead. Anyways, then Marlon goes on to say, I got to show you all this because William likes to lie about these things. If we can do July 8th at 8 p.m. EST, would that work? And then I say again, yep, that works for me. That's me in blue. I've said, yep, that works for me twice now. Then William, he tags him because William never responds. He tags him again. Let me know. I was able to move a debate up to move you guys in the spot. Still no reply from William. So this is the way it's been going for eight months. William will contact us, pretend he's ready. Then he won't reply for a week, for two weeks. Then when he replies, he says, oh, no, can't do it that date. Oh, I moved things around. Let's do it. Oh, you got a date? No, can't do it. I'm preparing. I'm, you know, I got to move here. I got to go there, right? I, I'm going to be washing my hair that day. <laughs> I don't know. What am I going to do with these, uh, uh, these Roman apologists? <laughs> aye, aye, aye. All right, folks. Um, Lizard King says the question is lost. Sorry, Lizard, you weren't quick enough. You weren't quick enough. So Slam is asking if I know Deutsch or something like that. He's saying something in Deutsch. <laughs> um, I guess I gave away. I don't know it, right? Something in Deutsch means I don't know Deutsch. All right, folks, if there are... Yeah, you're right. Breakfast gun. He can't set aside. Well, he could set aside three hours to debate people. I think I could be wrong on this, but if I'm not mistaken, he's debated Turretin fan now twice since we were supposed to debate. So he's managed to squeeze in some not, not just debates with Turretin fan. He's debated other people, too. He's getting them in there. He's got a lot of live sessions going on. He's appearing on other channels. By the way, you know, 
I never even said it. I mean, uh, I don't know. It, it, it just seems like unnecessary expenditure of energy, even trying to document all the lies that he's been telling on this. And what do I care? At the end of the day, I just want to debate the guy and, and have done with it. I know their goal is character assassination, slander me, lie about me, all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, one of the things he said, we agreed on June 20th. Marlon came back at one point and said, hey, guys, I think there's going to be a schedule conflict with my job. Can we move it to the 24th? Marlon quickly came back and says, never mind, there's not going to be a schedule conflict. Then William found that as his out. And he said, oh, sorry, since you said there might be a schedule conflict, I put another debate in that spot. So I'm debating somebody else on the 21st. Then I came back to William and said, William, that wasn't the date anyway. So you didn't pencil something into the spot we were supposed to be debating. So you should still have the 20th open, not the 21st. Then William kept repeating, I already scheduled somebody else for the 21st. And I kept saying, William, our debate was for the 20th. You're making a mistake. And uh, then, what? lo and behold, I look on the 21st. Was there any, even though that wasn't even the debate we were, the, the date we were supposed to debate, I look on the 21st. He didn't debate on the 21st. I think he debated either, the, I think it was the 23rd that he debated. I mean, it's incredible the number of, uh, you know, stories this guy is spinning. Um, BNA says, would you agree that we don't know if Sam is saved or not? What I would agree with is that Sam is proclaiming a gospel that Paul damned to hell. Okay, Paul said, if any man is preaching to you another gospel, let him be accursed. Okay, now, my hope is that Sam will repent. But just going on that criteria, all I know is Sam is proclaiming a gospel that's under the apostolic anathema. I don't have the liberty to pretend. Like, and this is what I've tried to tell people before. I could tell people what they want to hear. I could tell people that, okay, he's okay, he's fine. That isn't going to do anything to change what is written. I'm not doing anybody any favors, okay? I do nobody any favors telling them that something other than, if any man preaches to you another gospel, let him be accursed, okay? That's what's written. My word means nothing if it doesn't comport with that. So that's all I'm trying to tell people, and, and I'm content to say that. It doesn't involve any illicit judgment on my part. The apostle said, even if it was himself or an angel from heaven that was guilty of it, let them be anathema. There's only one gospel that saves, and it's the gospel that Paul proclaimed, the gospel of Christ crucified for sinners, raised for their justification, through faith in him were forgiven. But even apart from that, I mean, remember, the, the gospel, even though I've put the emphasis here on justification, I believe wholeheartedly, that the same gospel that justifies also sanctifies, that, that God not only delivers us from our guilt and gives us the right to eternal life, it also delivers us from our corruption. Now, this is progressive in this life and only perfect and complete in heaven, but it definitely is a reality for those who are in Christ. And so that's why Scripture makes much of the fruit uh, on the part of people. The same faith that lays hold of Christ for justification lays hold of Christ for sanctification. And so if you see a person who is so dead set against the fruit of the Spirit and so zealously seems to pursue and run in the direction of the works of the flesh, that's another telltale sign. And all these people that are turning a blind eye to that man's devilish actions while he calls everybody else a devil, look, I mean, just just face it, you you want to believe this guy for some other reason than biblical reasons. The Bible gives us a very clear way of demarcating true faith from false faith, what the gospel is from what the gospel isn't, and, and so forth. And, it, you know, I look, I understand nobody in, in, well, not nobody, but most of the people involved in this didn't know Sam as well as I did and weren't as close to him as I was. I have no special interest in Sam being a purveyor of a false gospel, if I could in any way bend over backwards to make it fit somehow, I'd be the first person to want to do that. But there's just no wiggle room when it comes to this. And the same thing goes with the fruits. Even by the standards of Rome's gospel, I mean, <laughs> Rome's never put out an official list of mortal sins. 
But Roman Catholics that are guilty of mortal sin will go to hell, not purgatory, according to Rome. And if some of what's on full display in that man is not a mortal sin, I don't know what is. Um, now, I don't think the Bible teaches the distinction between venial and mortal sins anyways. But if we're using Roman Catholic categories, then being impenitent in certain actions and behaviors, I mean, Often, when you when you look at excommunication, actual excommunication, I know I know a lot of people don't go to churches where they actually follow the biblical precedent to excommunicate people that deserve to be excommunicated, which is for their good, right? It's it's one of those final steps that will hopefully bring about their reclamation, their return, their repentance, for them to finally see what's where they're going and so forth. But uh, nine times out of ten, when it comes to an actual excommunication. The person isn't being excommunicated for the particular sin for which they're being disciplined. You know, when, when a person sins in a church that exercises discipline, there's usually various steps. They're called to repentance, right? If they don't accept that call to repentance, then uh, they're eventually barred from things like the Lord's table. You're, they're told they're not supposed to partake. And then if they continue impenitent, then they're eventually excommunicated. Now, it's a longer step. I gave you the, the short version of that. But... Uh, notice that in this, the excommunication is not a result of the original sin per se. It's a result of impenitence because the person has not come to repentance. Like, let's say the person commits adultery and uh, the person is uh, confronted and, uh, you know, the person remains in this adulterous relationship. Then the church may say at that point, you know, after many pleadings with the person to repent, you're not allowed to partake of the Lord's Supper. And then if the person persists in their sin, then the church will say, you know, you're excommunicated. The, the, the sin here is the sin of contumacy. That is persisting in sin, being recalcitrant. And, you know, a, when, when Rome makes this distinction between venial and mortal sins, you have to understand that any sin even a minor sin can become a major sin if it's the sort of thing that a person engages in with impunity and in impenitence. And just watching, I mean, one of the one of the signs, uh, according to 1 John, if a person wants to know, by the way, he also rejects that you can have assurance of faith. John writes a whole epistle on how you can have assurance of faith. You can have assurance that you're in the faith, that you're a believer. But one of the marks that John gives there to know that you're in the faith is that you love the brethren. Okay. One of the things that bothered me the most at the beginning of all this was the incredibly terrible treatment, not merely of Muslims, which I, uh, you know, I, I think that there is some strong language that we can use sometimes when, when interacting with them, I believe there's an extent beyond which we shouldn't go, but I mean, we can, we can speak firmly to Muslims. We can speak factually, you know, tell them that they have a false prophet, a false God. They're, you know, they're doomed and damned without Christ. All those sorts of things are legitimate to say. But some of it goes too far. And even that language is that language is even used for other brothers and sisters in Christ. Even those he considers to be fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. To me, that's just so incredibly shameful. And it's something that John says is a mark of a believer, that he or she loves the brethren. It doesn't mean that you'll never have any friction, you know, but there's a genuine love there for the brethren. You love the people of God. Okay. One thing I can tell you, and of course I've had, you know, conflict with people, things happen. uh, But I love Christ's people. I absolutely love the people of God. And when you see a person who's just so easy and quick to devour a person who names the name of Christ, that to me is just ghastly, you know? So, uh, I don't know, uh, false gospel, false fruit. I can tell you this. He'd never, he'd never last a month in a, (laughs) in Orthodox, uh, uh, church that administers church discipline. (laughs) In fact, I, in fact, I'll tell you this, something I've never said before. I've been contacted over the years by numerous people who served as this man's pastor. Numerous people asking, can you help us? 
this guy is like a ticking time bomb. Can you help us? Maybe you can get through to him. We cannot. Okay. This man has been a train wreck for years. Okay. Anyways, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I hope it was a benefit to you. I hope I showed you some things you haven't seen before. I hope I've given you material you're going to be able to use to uh, uh, witness to Jewish people, witness to others. Uh, pray it's a blessing. And uh, Oh, so Lizard King. I don't know if the guy's serious sometime or not. I'm going to answer this real quick, and then I'm going to go. Uh, he says, what's the criteria for being sent to hell? Sins are just basic enjoyments of life in many ways. Well, if it's a legitimate, if it, I mean, not legitimate, but if it is an actual sin, the very fact that you enjoy it is itself an indication of why, you know, you, you deserve the barbecue pit, right? Uh, I, I'm being a little bit like uh, my atheist friends, you know, they like to use all these epithets for hell and all the rest, but uh <laughs> If it's sin, it shouldn't be enjoyable to you. If it's enjoyable to you, it's proof that you're a sinner. Not just that you sin, but that you are a sinner, meaning that your very nature is sinful. And the reason something is a sin is because it violates God's standard. God's standard is a reflection of God himself. The, the commandments of God the moral norms of scripture are a reflection of who God is, what he's like, and of what he expects us to be like in relationship to him. And so when people flout these things, when they uh, so easily engage in them, they act like they're no problem, they act like they're just enjoyments, then they're showing how much they despise their creator and how much they have descended into sin. So that's not something to be proud of, right? That's something to, to cry out to God and say, oh, Lord, deliver me from uh, the flesh from this nature that loves sin and thinks of it as mere entertainment. Now, and then, and then he says, I shouldn't have to live to God's standards. Yeah. Who does God think he is? <laughs> who died and made him King? <laughs> well, the lizard King here says, <laughs> Oh, lizard King, you're too much. <laughs> you're too much. Who does God think he is? All right. Sorry, Lizard King. There's no vacancies. The throne is occupied. You're not going to get a chance to sit there anytime soon. God is king. God reigns. You are subject to him. And you are answerable to him. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, thank you, folks. Hope, again, it was a blessing to you. God bless and good night.